Yes, sir. I'll give the countdown. We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, one and all. I welcome everyone to the AIMS Annual Symposium 2021. Uh, we have some very interesting topics uh, laid out for you in today's symposium on uh, hip preservation surgeries. To take you all forward, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Uh, Pankaj Kanwal, the head of the Department of uh, and the Department of Orthopedics uh, of AIMS Rishikesh. Pankaj sir, please you may start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people in different time zones. Uh, we have been conducting the annual symposium every year. It is part of the tradition of the department. And these webinars uh, or these uh, rather symposiums usually come up with a theme of a very specific topic. And, uh, and that's how it has been so far. Because of the ongoing COVID issues, we, uh, we went ahead with this webinar. And, uh, and I'm extremely happy to say that there are uh, there is a stellar faculties who's going to talk about hip preservation surgeries. When everyone is talking, everyone is running behind arthroplasties, they want a quick fix solutions. We are here talking about something called as hip preservation. And uh, we have excellent faculty here who's going to take us through hip preservation as to what is the indication of surgery. They, they may share their uh, experience, their techniques of, of doing uh, arthroscopies and other kind of procedures which are not routinely done. I would like to mention uh, Dr. Kalia, who is a, a additional professor in our department, and also Dr. Tarun, who is associate professor in Ames Batinda, he has been uh, a faculty with us and a dear friend for bringing in such a uh, such a uh, uh, diverse kind of, I would say, faculty who are experienced in this particular topic in this, and uh, they're going to share their experience. I would like to uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Kalia, and he can take us through forward. Thank you. So good morning and good evening to all of people who are joined in and we'll be starting the session. Uh, you'll have uh, nine talks and you can keep on asking your questions on the chat box, uh, on the WhatsApp number or on the YouTube link that has been provided. And I'll be trying to answer all the questions that come as they come. We'll keep a few interesting questions at the end and we're going to ask our faculty to answer them. Uh, there will be an interactive uh, case which will be discussed at the end of all the talks. And uh, uh, now I ask Dr. Orko to start the session. So we'll be starting with session one. Uh, first of all, uh, to introduce, uh, introduce uh, we would like to carry forward with the clinical diagnosis of femoroastabular impingement. Dr. Rihan Ulhak, who is uh, going to talk on this. Sir, you may please start. Uh, yeah, good uh, afternoon, everyone. I think uh, at the very onset, uh, I would like to thank each and everyone from Ames Rishikesh for inviting me for this lecture and being the opening batsman for the femoroacetabular impingement session. So my talk is quite uh, focused. It is about clinical diagnosis of femoroacetabular impingement. Uh, probably uh, thinking of femoroacetabular impingement is not a very commonly identified problem, especially in our country. I decided to slightly expand the scope of my talk. So I will be basically talking of what is femoroacetabular impingement and why is it important? I would be talking about what are the different types of femoroacetabular impingement? What are the presenting complaints and tests for diagnosis of femoroacetabular impingement? And last but not the least, the differential diagnosis of young adult hip pain. The fourth point I have definitely kept because uh, looking at the practice in India, I think the causes of a young adult hip pain in the Indian society are quite different from what uh, the Western literature actually talks of. So what is femoroacetabular impingement and why is it important? 
if you look at the classical teaching which has always been done with us we have been taught that osteoarthritis of the hip or for that matter any joint can be of two types it can be either primary or idiopathic osteoarthritis or there may be a problem in the hip and gradually the hip goes and becomes arthritic which is basically called secondary osteoarthritis and this secondary osteoarthritis may be because of any reason it can be because of avian of the hip it may be because of trauma it can be because of parthes disease or whatever the problem with this binary approach of development of osteoarthritis of the hip is we believe that it is a linear process that means at one time you have a hip which is completely pristine it is a good hip and then it progresses to become an arthritic hip and once it becomes arthritic the only treatment that you have is a total hip replacement like what dr pankaj was saying that hip replacement is probably the one and only surgery which is being done globally across the world for any hip problem the problem is we do not believe that we can actually do an intervention to reverse this process that means we look at this hip and think that it is going to go here but we do not have any interventions which can somehow try to reverse this problem the problem with this binary approach of thinking that osteoarthritis of the hip is a progressive disease and it cannot be reversed is not like what other specialties think of for example if you have a heart failure the heart surgeon will not go and replace the heart immediately right he is going to put up some interventions to reverse this and try to get back to a healthy heart which does not happen for an orthopedic surgeon we believe that once there is a pristine hip there is an arthritic hip and this arthritic hip needs replacement so towards the early 19th century some orthopedic surgeons started looking at x rays of the hip more diligently they wanted to identify certain anatomic problems which may be identified early and which may be the cause of the later osteoarthritis that is developing so if you look at some of the classical papers this was one by mukulix as long as 1903 where he identified what dr sanjeev was talking of of some sort of a bump being present after a scaphy and a bumpectomy being done just to prevent later development of osteoarthritis and then you had papers from murray and stulberg who came up with the term of a pistol grip deformity so they were looking at the hip x rays more diligently they were trying to look at problems which may have been causing arthritis in the later years and then there was this dynamic and a huge body of work from the gans group who actually coined the term femoroacetabular impingement and the basic concept was that there are small deformities of the hip which can actually lead to osteoarthritis in the later years and they also came up with surgeries to clear up these small deformities early on so that osteoarthritis actually does not develop so from a more philosophical point of view what they were doing is they were completely turning the concept of osteoarthritis upside down till that time it was believed that osteoarthritis is a progressive process and all the anatomic deformities that we see like a pistol grip deformity or a tilt deformity or a bump are happening because of the arthritic process what the gans group did is they said that it is not like that it is because of these small deformities that the hip becomes gradually unstable or there is some degree of micro motion between the acetabulum and the hip and some degree of instability and that is the cause of the later development of osteoarthritis so once this concept became more and more solid you had the era of hip preserving surgeries that means some surgeons started believing that if you can identify these small deformities and you can treat these small deformities you can actually prevent development of osteoarthritis which was a huge shift from the previous thinking where it was thought that this process will just continue and it brought about this concept of hip preservation surgery so that is why 
femoro acetabular impingement is important because if you identify it early and if you actually do a treatment early you are trying to say that you can actually prevent development of osteoarthritis in a patient with a hip problem so the gans group and then the people who have worked later identified basically three types of femoro acetabular impingement the one which is very commonly seen as the pincer type that means there is an over coverage of the femoral head this over coverage may be segmental that means most commonly on the anterior part of the hip joint or it may be on the posterior point or it may be a complete global sort of a pincer pincer deformity for example a protrusion that means the head is deeply seated into the acetabulum and it is covered from 360 degrees and then you have this cam sort of a lesion where there is a bump which is in the region of the femoral neck and as soon as you have a flexion this cam goes and hits against the acetabulum which not only causes a labral damage but gradually the labral damage progresses to cause cartilage damage and finally an arthritis of the hip and last but not the least you can have the third time which is a combined type so basically small lesions which may not be identified by an untrained eye but if recognized early and if treated early may result in a disaster like a secondary arthritis of the hip which actually requires a total hip replacement and all of us know that the native hip actually is always better than a total hip that has been done so some scope for surgeons to put in their scopes or do a surgery and actually prevent the hip from developing arthritis so how do you actually make a diagnosis of femoro acetabular impingement knowing that it is something important first and foremost the most important complaint with the patient comes with is pain in a patient if you take a focused history in a patient with femoro acetabular impingement the pain is usually insidious in onset and it is of a long duration unlike other conditions of the hip like osteonecrosis of the femoral head or a stress fracture where the pain is sudden in onset and usually of a shorter duration and this is the classical c sign that you get that is the pain is localized in the region of the groin rather than being present laterally medially or posteriorly in a number of young patients the pain actually presents like a groin pull that occurs with certain activities for example the patient is a football player or a rugby player or a hockey player and they after the game they start complaining of pain which is classically localized in the region of the groin and this pain unlike pain of arthritis occurs more during sitting as compared to walking it is actually relieved by standing and walking so this is because when the patient is sitting the anterior rim and the femoral pain is actually associated with popping and catching which is basically a sign actually help a person to know whether there is femoro acetabular impingement or not however mind you there has been a large number of recent papers which have also suggested that besides the groin pain you may have an anterior thigh pain you may have knee pain you may have lateral thigh pain or even a lateral hip pain in limited number of patients so besides the groin pain there may be pain in the other regions also and therefore it is very important not only to take a focused history but also do a radiological examination and other tests which i think the other speakers are going to be talking of so the classical test for femoro acetabular impingement we all know that it is the anterior type of femoro acetabular impingement which is most common and the test that you need to do is the flexion adduction internal rotation test that means you flex the hip you adduct it and then you internally rotate so the moment you do this the it is assumed that the bump or the cam lesion actually goes and hits against the labrum or the pincer lesion catches the hip joint and that is why there is generation of the pain 
the other test which may be done in a posterior sort of a problem that means a posterior impingement is the classical faber's test or the figure of four test also known as the patrick's test because in this you do flexion abduction and external rotation however whenever this but not the least the other important test is an extension external rotation test that means you take the patient on the side of the table you extend his hip and then you externally rotate and again this is a test for posterior impingement and may be positive in a limited group of patients one more important thing i would want to talk because the my mandate was only to talk about the clinical tests and not talk of the radiology the place where i was trained my boss before he used to do any intervention for a femoroacetabular impingement always used to do a hip injection under a c arm so you put in a needle inside the hip you push in some degree of air to be sure that you are inside the hip and then give a local anesthetic or a steroid if the pain completely disappears you are 100% sure that the pain is actually arising from the hip joint and not from an extra articular problem and once that is sure probably you have done your other things and then probably do a surgery so this is something which i would like to emphasize that before commit committing oneself to saying that the problem is intra articular probably a hip injection is a good thing to do just looking at this long list of differential diagnoses of hip pain in a young adult i think in the indian scenario whenever the patient a young adult hip patient comes with pain we think of these conditions given in the dark green osteonecrosis of the hip tb hip pigmented villonodular synovitis synovial chondromatosis referred pain from the spine or the sacroiliac joint and last but not the least stress factors in recruits or people who have started walking uh, recently but in the western society i think uh, the other problems like labral tears snapping hip sore tendonitis iliotibial band syndrome trochanteric bursitis and sports hernia are also very common and these are also the problems which need to be recognized and need to be dealt with before you are actually making a final diagnosis of femoroacetabular or impingement and i think going into a detailed history the clinical examination and the site of pain actually makes one's life very easy for example a labral tear usually presents with a catching sort of a pain and usually associated with a positive flexion adduction internal rotation test similarly a snapping hip which may be because of the source or the iliotibial band usually presents as an a groin or a lateral side pain so basically what i'm trying to say is before committing yourself to making a diagnosis of femoroacetabular impingement on the clinical basis you need to rule out a lot of other conditions so just a small take home message is that femoroacetabular impingement is important because early recognition and intervention may actually prevent the development of late osteoarthritis which is something which is very fascinating because you are, you are actually able to preserve a joint which we previously used to think is not possible it is basically of three types it can be pincer type it can be cam type or it can be combined type and your radiology and clinical examination will actually help you to know whether it is femoroacetabular impingement and if it is there what type of femoroacetabular impingement it is the characteristic pain and tests will help you to make a clinical diagnosis however before you actually commit to saying that it is fai rule out all the other conditions that is the differential diagnosis of hip pain in a young adult thank you very much thank you so much sir uh, that was an excellent presentation uh, next we would like to continue with the further presentations and continuing it uh, 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 further uh, the next topic uh dr himanshu kochar i would like to invite dr himanshu kochar to talk on uh, investigations in the suspected case of fai
सर प्लीज अनम्यूट यूर सेल्फ सर डॉक्टर हिमांशु इज नॉट ऑडिबल टू अस नाउ आई एम ऑडिबल Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible now, sir. Audible. Okay. So uh, the topic. I, I told Dr. Kalia that I am not a hip surgeon, but still I peeped into it and uh, uh, I was asked to take a task for the investigation in a case of fire. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 he has nicely covered uh, this. Uh, uh, Dr. Rehan has nicely covered the clinical part of it. So in, in the investigations, uh, just a minute. yeah i will not go in the overview it just uh, i will just uh, touch that in a pincer it may be a general type of a uh, impingement or maybe foca type of impingement which we will see on the radi serial radiographs right? and uh, just a minute hmm. and on the femur femur side the head may be asymmetrical and uh, there may be osseous bump and uh, it may be lateral or it may be anterior superior and uh, femoral retro torsion or coxa vara minor okay so so the, i will not go into the details so the role of imaging the conventional radiographs have a bearing in the diagnosis of femoral acetabular impingement the most important is the anterior posterior view uh, the axial cross table view for the proximal femur 45 degree and 90 degree done view frog like lateral view and false profile view so i will just go uh, go through each each one of them so this is the ap view so how it is to be taken like if you don't instruct your radiographers to get give give you the proper radiographic views you will not be able to pick up these subtle radiographic signs so that you can diagnose a femoral acetabular impingement hmm? so this is uh, the gantry is, is almost 120 cm should be there it should be the the internal the extremity should be rotated 15 degrees internally and and this uh, the, the x ray beam should be almost midway between the as line joining between the asas and the pubic symphysis and this is the cross table lateral view the x ray machine is around at an angle of 45 degrees and you can use the filler so that there is a little scatter uh, the scattering is minimized and you have to uh, focus on the affected head this is the cross table lateral view so it gives you the profile of the head then uh, basically the the femoral head and the neck junction then the 45 degree turn view in this the hip is flexed to about 45 degrees and affected to about 20 degrees and usually the x ray beam is around this distance is x ray from the this the the uh, this distance is around 102 cm so it is not 120 uh, cm it is around 102 m so they should be the positioning should be accurate so that we get proper views then 90 degree turn view this is how this is done uh, this is 20 degree abduction and the hip is flexed at 90 degree this is the frog leg lateral view which is routinely done in our opds it provides the head and neck junction adequately the hip is abducted around 45 degrees and knee flexed around 30 to 40 degrees and greater trochanter sometimes can obscure the head and neck and all this is for false profile view it's a weight bearing view and uh, basically the the patient is at around 65 degrees the affected affected hip is in the in contact with the in the fill and the basically the the x ray beam is directly double and uh, directed towards the hip so tilt and rotation should be taken into consideration the distance between the pubic symphysis to the uh, to the tip of the cockets should be around 1 to 3 cm the obturator foramen should be symmetric in appearance and the tear drops should also be symmetrical so ap pelvic and the pelvic profile views provide most information about the acetabular morphology 
lateral and the done views highlight the pachyonotomy of the proximal part of the femur. So, acetabular depth. First, uh, first I will uh, tell you about the acetabular parameters. Acetabular depth. So, it is judged by the ilio ischial line. If the, the medial part of the head is at the ilio ischial line or it is just medial to that, that is oxa profunda. Uh, if the floor of the uh, this uh, fossa acetaboli touches or it's medial to the ilio ischial line. And if it is and it is called protrusio acetaboli, that is a global kind of a pincer uh, kind of a It is medial to the, um, uh, if the medial aspect of the femoral head is medial to the ilio line, as the picture shows, this is uh, aceta protrusio acetaboli. Then the acetabular inclination, it may be normal, it may be increased, it may be decreased. So th this is judged by Tony angle. So it is, um, well, we can calculate this by three lines. First line is the transverse axis of the pelvis that is joining the base of both the tear drops. This is the uh, basically the weight bearing part of the acetabular uh, sources. This is inferior sources and this is the lateral sources. So this line two is drawn parallel to this from the medial edge of the inferior, this eye point, or you can say the medial part of the acetabular weight bearing part. Okay. And from here, the, well, just a minute. This line is parallel to this line, and this line joins the medial part to the lateral part. So this angle, so it is formed by the intersection of lines two and three. Acetabular having tonus angle zero to ten are considered normal. More than ten, that is then that, that means it's increased inclination and it is subject to structural instability. But if it is less inclination, it is at a risk of a pincer type of a femoroacetabular impingement. Then the acetabular coverage part. So this is judged by the CE angle. So on the uh, lateral CE angle, so that is also known as Weber angle. Values less than 25 degrees are basically the the coverage is inadequate. So how it is drawn? It is drawn by first of first of all in all these first we have to make the transverse axis of the pelvis by joining the base of the tear drops a perpendicular is drawn to this line and from this uh, this is the center of the head and from there the lateral uh, a line is drawn to the lateral edge so this angle is calculated calculated if it is more uh, like if it is less it is less covered if it is more you, uh, that will be that will cause the impingement then the anterior angle that is calculated on the false profile view and the this gives about the anterior coverage. Same, a perpendicular line is made from the center of the head. And from this point, a line is drawn to the anterior most edge of the acetabulum. And this angle is calculated. Uh, calculated and the values under less than 20 uh, suggest of under coverage. And if uh, there is a, uh, like if there is an impingement, so then this angle will be increased. So acetabular version. Version can be uh, like that. Uh, this is difficult to determine. We need to carefully assess the film. Large element of error may be introduced because of the excessive uh, uh, excessive pelvic tilt or rotation. There is a lack of clarity of the anterior of the posterior margin. So, uh, to judge for the posterior, uh, basically the posterior aspect of the rim. You can start from the basically ischia. So that will give you a guide where is the posterior, uh, basically the wall of the uh, acetabulum. So if there is a crossover, that means there is a, uh, next slide, uh, there is a focal anterior over coverage of the hip. This is in a 29 year old female. There is a acetabular retroversion. It is defined when uh, the anterior wall is being more lateral than the posterior wall. Whereas in the normal hip, anterior wall lies more medially. So here you can see there is a, this is the anterior wall and there is a focal uh, overhang of the anterior wall. So this is the figure of it, figure of it, configuration of uh, figure of it crossover. Head sphericity, it is spherical or aspherical. It is judged on AP view, done views, frog like lateral or a cross lateral view. Most templates can be used if the femoral epiphysis extends beyond the, the reference 
the of the circle by 2 mm the femoral head is considered spherical if the epiphysis is uh, like if the, it does not extend beyond the two millimeters, it is considered sapphire. Okay, so this is one of the you can see the, it is perfect circle, and here uh, it is just it is not uh, spherical, asymmetrical. So in uh, this is a, just an example that on AP view you can see it is nicely spherical, but if we see the other view, you can see it is not spherical and there, there is a bump visible. So you need to always. Check the other um, two or more orthogonal views to, uh, to diagnose or to pinpoint the issue. Hmm. Uh, position of the hip center. So it may be lateralized, but it may not be lateralized. So orbit uh, value is taken as more than 10 millimeters from the ilioischial line. So if the median aspect of the femoral head is more than this, that means there is under coverage. If it is inside, you can see it is profunda or it is, pro uh, if uh, it is a continuation, it can lead to protrusive acetabular. Then the head and neck offset and head and neck junction. You can see this is a normal junction. There is a decreased offset and then you can see there is a bump. So these subtle things need to be looked for. Then there is an angle, there is an alpha angle. So alpha angle, this is drawn. A line, uh, this is a head and neck central line is drawn. And from there, a line is drawn from where the head becomes no, non spherical So this angle is, if the values are more than 45 degrees, they are suggestive of a head and neck offset deformity. And classically, they, they were initially described for MRI, but it can be used for the radiographs also. So this is the normal angle, uh, uh, this is showing normal angle. And you can see this is showing a normal uh, increased alpha angle. It is, uh, hmm. Head and neck offset ratio is obtained from the uh, lateral radiographs. In these three lines are drawn. One line is drawn in the long axis of the femoral neck. One uh, is drawn at the anterior neck, and one is drawn at the anterior femoral head. So this ratio is calculated this upon this. So if the ratio is less than 0 0.17, a cam kind of a deformity is likely to be present. Then. With on standing phi like femoral acetabular impingement, recurrent impingement can lead to ossification of the lateral. Uh, lateral basically, you can see this there's the ossification of the labrum. You can see the double contour on the radiograph. So, these subtle signs need to be looked for. Then, because of the abnormal stress in the impinging hip, there may be you can see this fragment can get uh, like separated off, it can break off. So, it is also known as os acetabular. Herniation pits, if uh, somebody has a herniation pit, like these are the radial lucencies, which has this uh, subtle, this uh, sclerotic margin is there in the superior, basically superior quadrant of the femoral leg. Usually it is present in 33% of the cases of fire. And usually they range from three millimeters to 15 millimeters with an average of around five millimeters. So if one find a uh, uh, juxta articular cyst, they should be considered as a risk for femoral acetabular impingement rather than a benign one. Similarly, uh, you can see this is a pincer kind, this is an indentation pit, and there is a basically uh, a reactive, a reactive bone formation. This is visible both on the X-rays and the uh, MRI films. You can see this is a reactive bone formation. So MRI can, can also substantiate diagnosis uh, and labrum tears one can pick uh, with the MRI or MR arthrogram. And usually, femoral acetabular impingement is, is uh, often bilateral, so, but it may be present asynchronously. Although the symptomatic presentation may be laid on one side, but we should always, it is recommended that we should examine both the uh, hip joints if, her, if patient is symptomatic on one side. And if patient has only radiographic, uh, uh, like you have picked up a, on radiography, you have picked up that there is an impingement, and patient doesn't not have. So gold standard is that, that the patient should have pain and not the imaging alone. Like you should not, uh, patient should also have a pain there. So to, to summarize, basically uh, what happens in the, on the radiographic science, basically in the pincer impingement, there is a coxa profunda. This is a generalized type of a basically impingement. Then focal acetabular retroversion is there. That is a figure of eight configuration, lateral, Center to edge angle is increased. That is a more than um, more than thirty nine degrees. 
reduce extrusion angle as the well index is less than zero uh, less than or equal to zero and there is a posterior wall sign and if we compare it with the cam kind of impingement there is a uh, pistol grip deformity then ccd distance is less than uh, 125 degrees and there is a horizontal growth plate sign and on a cross table radiograph you may see a linear indentation sign which i have shown and the alpha angle may be more than 50 degrees the femoral head and neck offset less than 8 millimeters offset ratio may be less than uh, 0.18 and the femoral retro torsion might be there and secondary changes may be present like herniation pits ossification of the labrum appositional bone sign or cestabulum and posterior inferior joint space loss this is uh, seen on the fox profile view in pincer head and uh, in pincer heads and late sign would be osteoarthritis so it is mandatory that we should see some uh, these uh, subtle signs and and we uh, diagnose them early so that we can prevent the osteoarthritis of the hip at a later date thank you i end my discussion it is open for uh, questions thank you so much sir for such an elaborate presentation without much ado i would like to go on to our next uh, talk uh, our next speaker is dr tarun goel uh, who would be taking us to our next topic uh, that is role of hip arthroscopy in a femoral vestibular impingement over to you sir hi uh, can you see my screen can you hear yes, me sir. yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, we'll start with the next talk. That is the role of hip arthroscopy in femoral vestibular impingement. Uh, we intend to see the uh, indications of hip arthroscopy in FAI and discuss the basic hip arthroscopy techniques. And then uh, we also intend to go through the, uh, the surgical technique of uh, the FAI on the femoral side because I've been seeing the the agenda for this uh, meet today and uh, we do have lectures covering the labrum and the estabulum side and uh, uh, so i thought it would be appropriate to introduce to the basic techniques of hip arthroscopy and then discuss the management of the femoral side conditions in my talk aims of uh, uh, hip preservation is to restore early hip dysfunction and prevent premature onset of osteoarthritis of the hip joint. Uh, the various indications for which hip arthroscopy may be performed in may include the loose bodies or bony fragments inside the hip joint, such as Sandoval chondromatosis or other uh, loose bodies, labral injuries and FAI form the bulk of the indications for which the, uh, the, uh, the hip arthroscopy may be performed. Sometimes it may also be performed for inflammatory arthritis, for sinovectomies, and other synovial lesions. It may be performed for debridement of septic or tubercular arthritis of the hip joint, and also for extra-articular lesions involving the iliopsoas or the trochanteric region. Uh, the genesis of femoral estabular impingement and clinical examination has been very well uh, covered uh, in, the, uh, in the detailed talks by the previous speakers. And we know that the pincer impingement, it leads to primary damage to the estabular labrum. Whereas uh, the articular cartilage of the estabulum is involved late and there is variable amount of damage to the articular cartilage. In CAM, what happens is delamination of the anterolateral that is the most commonly involved part of um, uh, the, in, in the hip joint. Uh, there is delamination of the anterolateral articular surface of the estabulum and uh, the femoral side cartilage remains relatively intact in these cases. But we should also remember that morphological or radiologically evident FAI does not mean that it is clinically evident FAI. So these patients should have clinical symptoms before we offer them any sort of hip arthroscopy. Conditions that we commonly see for treatment of FAI uh, may include the primary or the idiopathic FAI. Then FAI may also be present in setting of hip dysplasia. It may be in sickle of Perthes disease or slipped capital femoral epiphysis in children, sickle of various hip trauma or post-infective etiologies. It may be, uh, we have seen many cases of uh, healed, partially healed avascular necrosis in which there is only little flattening of the femoral head with formation of bumps at the periphery. 
uh, of the lesion, which again uh, uh, amounts to secondary FAI. And sometimes it may also be seen in uh, patients with previous fractures of the femoral neck. <coughs> Basic techniques of hip arthroscopy. <coughs> so uh, we can uh, do a hip arthroscopy on a standard fracture table uh, with a uh, standard table with fracture table attachments, that is the traction attachments. The perineal portion is slightly different. What we used uh, for normal hip uh, surgery, such as a DHS or any other uh, hip surgery or a, a, a femoral a lower limb surgery on a traction table, which is a bigger perineal force. It is more padded. And uh, the purpose is to lateralize or to give a lateral traction to the femoral head while uh, the traction is being applied so that uh, there is more space uh, for the instruments and the arthroscope to enter inside the hip joint because the hip joint has to be pulled out to traction uh, in these cases. We generally start with the limb in uh, uh, neutral or slight abduction, about 10-15 degrees of flexion and slight internal rotation. Internal rotation would help to, you know, uh, lax, make the capsule slightly relax so that the hip can be stretched out and uh, um, some space can be created between the estabulum and the femoral head for a smooth entry. And uh, again, the flexion will help to slightly relax the hip joint capsule. Uh, we initially would start with slight abduction, but after the traction, even slight adduction may be given in order to provide more uh, uh, lateral traction lever against the big perineal post that we're using to the femoral head. The contralateral extremity is also put in traction so that the traction becomes effective this, uh, and it's kept in slight abduction, in abduction so that the image intensifier can be uh, kept between the two legs for the image. Uh, we are aiming at a distraction of about 8 to 10 millimeters of the hip joint for the instruments to enter inside without damaging the labrum or the cartilage on the estabular or the femoral head. And uh, most commonly when we enter inside the hip joint, we enter with a 70 degree arthroscope. Uh, that's the most commonly used uh, endoscope for the hip joint arthroscopy. The patient is such position. This is a large perineal post in the in the figure on the top. You can see a large padded perineal post. This is a common draping. This is the area that we actually need for the surgery and the, and the other area can be draped out in uh, adhesive uh, plastic uh, or any other uh, draping sheet. Uh, the common portals that we use is an anterolateral portal. We generally use a Seldinger's technique in which a large needle is entered inside the hip joint when the hip joint is in traction. So uh, we will, I'll, I'll come to the Seldinger's technique. Uh, the common portals will be the anterolateral portal, the anterior portal and the posterolateral portal. So the anterolateral portal, if you can see the figure down, the anterolateral portal is about one centimeter superior and one centimeter anterior to the anterior edge of the greater trochanter. And the posterolateral portal is the mirror is about one centimeter superior and posterior to the posterior border of the greater trochanter. And the anterior border is about, is, uh, is along the vertical line or slightly uh, lateral to the vertical line uh, from the anterior superior iliac spine in level with the anterior lateral portal. Then we can have some supplementary portals inside the hip. Uh, some of them will be used, uh, are actually useful for arthroscopy, uh, for femoral estabular impingement, such as a distal anterolateral portal. So the distal anterolateral portal is again a commonly used portal for cam resection. And uh, that is situated about four to five centimeters distal to the anterolateral portal. Another portal that can be used, maybe it can be used in place of the anterior portal is a slight, is a mid anterior portal, which is slightly distal and lateral to the standard anterior portal. So a Seldinger technique, the trajectory is about 15 degrees up and 15 degrees behind. And uh, the joint has been distracted. You can see uh, uh, there is air inside the joint. So air has been injected to, uh, uh, um, uh, with, a, with a needle. The needle is, should be slightly away from the edge of the estabulum because we should remember that the edge of the estabulum re represents the bony edge of the estabulum. There will be labrum, uh, which will be a few millimeters thick, extending beyond the edge of the estabulum, and it should not be injured by our instrumentation. So uh, the needle or any other instruments has to be away from um, um, a couple of uh, millimeters away from the edge of the bony edge of the Estabulum. Sufficient distraction should be obtained before we are trying to enter inside the hip joint with our instrumentation. 
So we start with the diagnostic hip arthroscopy. We start with the central compartment first in most of the cases, although there are techniques that describe the, the, lateral comp the, the peripheral compartment first techniques, but the standard ones would be the anterior compartment first. And um, we generally start with the lateral procedures because they are still done uh, along with the central compartment. So uh, the basic difference is when we're looking at the central compartment, central compartment is what is inside the labrum, what is inside the, within the confines of the labrum or deeper to the labrum, which will include the portions of the femoral head, the entire acetabulum, the pulvinar, the ligamentum teres, and the entire hip joint. And the things which are outside this, which will include the peripheral part of the femoral head, the head neck junction, and uh, other soft tissues around will include the peripheral compartment. So labral procedures will be done. So when we are looking at the central compartment, we need the traction. So the hip has to be distracted so that we can enter the central compartment. But when we are looking at the peripheral compartment, we release the, uh, the traction so that uh, we can come out of the hip joint and look at the periphery with the traction released. So um, uh, while the traction is still on after the diagnostic arthroscopy, the labral procedures can be performed and later on the, the cam lesions can be addressed. The cam lesions are, uh, are peripheral to the, uh, the, the level of the labrum. So uh, they are in the peripheral compartment and they will be a part of the peripheral compartment arthroscopy. Traction is applied for the pincer resection for the lateral repairs and all intraarticular work. Then the traction is removed to perform the cam resection. Dynamic examination uh, during the hip arthroscopy, uh, for example, uh, we'll flex the hip joint uh, to look at the, the extent of the lesion along the femoral neck. Then you can internal rotate and external rotate to look at the lateral and the medial extent of the lesion. And also dynamic examination, you will abduct and see an internal rotate and maybe see that whether the cam resection that is performed is enough or not, or is there any other uh, part, any other part which is still aspherical and is still impinging with the labrum on movement. So as we discussed, the central compartment will be composed of the femoral head, the acetabulum, the pulpinar or the fat pad, the ligamentum teres, the labrum, and the perif. This uh, on the left would be generally be the first view that you will obtain with a 70 degree arthroscope when you enter inside the hip joint with the anterolateral portal. So at seven o'clock position, you can see the femoral head, and on the right side, you can see the acetabulum. These are the this is the acetabulum cartilage and the femoral head, and uh, this triangle, the red triangle on the top, you can see is basically the anterior, uh, a part of the anterior hip joint capsule. And this is again the part of the central compartment, which is uh, the part where you will see the pulvinar and the ligamentum teres. Once you have entered inside the hip joint and made the anterolateral portal and the anterior portal, anterior portal will generally be used for instrumentation. And once these two portals have been made, a capsulotomy is performed between these two portals. So the skin uh, entry points of these portals are different, but when, once they are converging uh, inside the hip joint, the labrum, uh, the cartilage of the hip, the, I'm sorry, the capsule of the hip joint between these two portals is incised to give us uh, a working space uh, inside the hip joint, both for the central and the peripheral compartment. So a capsulotomy, which is performed a centimeter distal to the labrum to avoid any injury to the labrum uh, is performed. This is followed by any synovectomy or any LT, that is ligamentum teres issues that needs to be addressed. Then you can come out and have a look at the labral tissue, probe it and see whether it is intact. Have a look at the uh, peripheral articular cartilage to see for delamination or any other pathologies that needs to be addressed. Peripheral compartment, have a look at the femoral head neck junction, peripheral part of the femoral head and soft tissues such as the iliopsoas attachment and the capsule. So once the traction is released, you come now to the peripheral compartment, the hip is flexed to about 30 to 40 degrees and you reach the peripheral compartment. And the hip is flexed so that uh, there's more room for instrumentation in the front because the anterior capsule becomes lax. The capsulotomy has already been performed and there's sufficient room in the front for the arthroscope and your instruments to visualize and work. Generally, there'll be a lot of soft tissues, particularly if you have cam lesions, there'll be a lot of uh, soft tissues and fibrocartilage around the cam lesions. 
which needs to be divided before the actual lesions can be identified. So uh, this is a look at the peripheral compartment. Uh, you can add, see there's a small cam lesion that you can see at the humoral head neck junction. And um, this uh, uh, is a capsulotomy which has been performed, visualizing the femoral head and neck. And on the image on the right, we'll show you uh, a bump on the cam lesion on the femoral head neck junction, which is visualized after debridement. And the entire femoral head neck area can be visualized. Important to see uh, that how far can we go with the debridement. Uh, we need to identify the blood supply to the femoral head goes uh, through the terminal branches, the medial circumflex femoral artery through particularly the lateral synovial fold. So identification of the position of the lateral synovial fold and also the medial synovial fold, which are uh, more or less at the lateral and the medial uh, edge, uh, lateral and the medial edge of the coronal cut of the femoral head, uh, they needs to be visualized. This can be e easily visualized on uh, the arthroscopy. The image on the right will show you the, the, the vertical arrow shows uh, the lateral uh, synovial fold and the horizontal arrow shows the zona ob uh, obicularis, which is basically a capsular thickening uh, or a funnel-shaped capsular constriction um, uh, at, the, at, the, at approximately the, uh, the head neck junction, distal to the head neck junction uh, at the level of the uh, femoral neck. And while visualizing arthroscopically, this will also be a guide for the cam resection because this will also form the, one of the, um, the limits of the cam resection. So this is uh, just a, a representation on the CT scan on where you will identify, where you will generally encounter the lateral synovial fold. So that will be the place for the lateral synovial fold in most of the cases, um, which is again the antero lateral part of the femoral head neck junction. So mostly uh, with the anterior portal, you will do debridement in the front of this place. You will try to identify the synovial folds and not go beyond that with the anterior portal, at least not damage these folds Posterior hip arthroscopy can also be performed through the posterior lateral portal that we discussed previously, which will be used to visualize and address the posteriorly located cam lesions if they are impinging. Zona ovicularis, as we discussed, was a constriction of the, uh, of the capsule uh, at almost the mid portion of the femoral neck and forms a limit for the cam resection. This is how this will look like after the cam resection. How much to resect? As we discussed, the medial synovial fold and the lateral synovial fold, they form the medial and the lateral boundary for the anterior cam resections. Distal will be zona obicularis, proximally. Generally, don't go beyond five millimeters distal to the articular, uh, the estabulum labrum, in order to avoid injury to the weight bearing or the, uh, the articulating part of the femoral head. Judgment during arthroscopy is very important. Judgment and experience uh, for resection of the cam lesions because most of the times the problem will be you will, un will be under resecting the cam lesion. Fluoroscopic guidance, preoperative calculation, and preoperative templating is a very important step in order to have a successful cam resection. Although in some of the radiographs, you can still have a look at uh, and target the radiological angle such as the alpha angle, the femoral ethnic offset. <coughs> So just presenting a case of a 20 year old female who had avian uh, avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis of the femoral head. She was symptomatic for two years, had right pain with the section of internal rotation. This was a, a radiograph which showed an impinging um, cam lesion uh, along the femoral head neck junction. The, uh, there was very limited head collapse. There was uh, not a much head collapse and the avian had healed by this time. This was a sickly avian. Uh, maybe because of partial flattening of the femoral head at the periphery, she had developed a cam lesion uh, secondary to remodeling of the bone in that area. And this is a short video that will uh, show we, we can. So again, this was uh, the central compartment we were looking at. The central compartment was uh, visualized and addressed for any uh, pathologies and then coming to the peripheral compartment, this is the cut edge of, of the capsule. Now we're working deep to the capsule at, uh, to remove the soft tissues in this area and trying to identify 
the cam lesion, the impinging cam lesion. So once the capsule is clear, you can have a look at the impinging cam lesion. The traction is off now and the femoral head is inside the confines of the labrum. And this is a large cam lesion that we can uh, see here. We'll use the burrs in order to shave this cam lesion. And uh, the cam lesion is identified with movement of the hip joint in rotation, flexion, and extension. And uh, resection of the cam with burrs is performed under uh, guidance of image intensifier. to achieve a base and uh, 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 to a point where the lesion is no longer impinging. And create, recreate the femoral head neck offset in that area. The, the post-operative motion uh, showed improvement in internal rotation and movement of the hip joint and also improvement in hip pain scores. So arthroscopic assessment of hip motion is key for evaluation of hip impingement. Cam lesion management involves primarily the peripheral compartment. Arthroscopic osteochondroplasty needs judgment aided with image and preoperative template. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for an excellent talk. Uh, next, I would like to uh, move ahead with our uh, second session. The first session has been concluding uh, here. Uh, with this, I would like to call upon Dr. Abhay Anans, the head of the department of, of All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, Jodhpur. He'll be talking on the topic, open surgery for femoroastabular uh, impingement. When and how? Sir, uh, please continue for. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pankaj and Dr. Talia for the invite. And my brief today is FAI open surgery, when and how. So if you look at the background, which has already been alluded to, so I'll rush through this. FAI in essentially includes deformities in the acetabulum and the femur head neck junction, the pincer cam and the mixed varieties. And the central hallmark of uh, which patient will need uh, something doing is a patient who has limited hip range of motion and abnormal uh, intraarticular contact area with early damage to labrum and articular cartilage causing hip pain and reduced range of motion. So the goal will be to minimize current symptoms, delay arthritic change, and return the patient to an asymptomatic state. The patients may be managed conservatively or surgically through closed or open means. And the current surgical options which we have are either open or closed, that is open or surgical or arthroscopic. So the arthroscopic management has been touched by Dr. Tarun and the open surgical management essentially involve, involves the safe surgical dislocations and bumpectomies or removal of the pencil lesions and the reverse periastabular osteotomies or the minimal or basically removal of the uh, mixed lesions with uh, via a mini open direct anterior approach. So what is the indication of uh, doing an open surgical treatment? Essentially, when all your conservative med med modalities have expired, the symptoms, if they persist for more than six months, we have, uh, if we have a series of positive clinical tests, the anti-impingement tests, the FABA, the FADIR, the IROP, the lateral rim, and the posterior rim impingement tests. Although uh, the review of literature of uh, the validity of these tests report that they have only a moderate to a poor clinical uh, correlation with the type of symptomatic lesions that are present in FAI. But when these tests together with the radiographic signs uh, give a good indication of which patient needs a, needs a surgery. So the signs on F of FAI on radiographs, MRs, and CT scans essentially are the pistol grip sign, the femoral head neck offset more than 50, posterior wall sign, the crossover sign because of acetabular retroversion, a coxa profunda or a grade one protrusio, and damage to the acetabular rim or labrum. 
So the treatment objectives, whether it is a pincer, a cam, or bila or both, is essentially to eliminate the abnormal contact area between the acetabular rim and the femoral neck for pincers, and to remove the area of asphericity for the cam lesions. And these are essentially done by localized uh, acetabular localized trimming of the acetabular overcoverage in a pincer lesion by periacetabular osteotomies, which are addressing the retroversion, or these are redirectional osteotomies of the acetabular socket in retroverted acetabular cases, or looking after the global overcoverage of the acetabulum as in combined lesions by trimming the anterior rim, entire rim. For the CAM, the basic thought process is to remove excessive bone and cartilage at the head neck junction and improve the alpha angle and head neck offset to come back to something less than 50, preferably around 40 to 45. So the guidelines for surgical treatment of uh, FAIR, you have to have a patient more than 15 years old. And the important thing is that neither symptoms alone nor imaging findings can be a very sure shot indication for who gets a surgical treatment for FAI. So the basic decision of who gets a, a surgical open surgical treatment for FAI essentially comprises of a combination of the two, this clinical symptoms and the radiographic imaging parameters. And the parameters which one needs to keep in mind is hip pain, which is worsened by flexion activities and unresponsive to three months of conservative therapy with positive impingement signs. On the imaging side, corroborating with these clinical symptomatologies in a more than 15 year old child, what you need to see is a pistol grip deformity, an alpha angle more than 50, posterior wall signs, a, clinic, a crossover sign of a response, basically indicative of a retroversion, coxa profundas, coxa protrusio, a damaged acetabular rim if somebody has had a diagnostic arthroscopy, and no evidence of advanced OA and evidence of severe chondral damage. So the basic treatment modalities are the safe surgical dislocation, and the indications for those are uh, clinical indications and radiographic indications. So almost 70% of these patients would have hip pain with a positive impingement sign in 60%, with a painful hip with a reduced range of motion in about 60%, activity-related groin pain in about 27%, and, and those who are unresponsive to therapy in about 30% of the cases. On the radiographic side, these are patients who would have an acetabular retroversion, a bony prominence at the head neck per junction in about 55%, limited osteoarthritis in about 45 to 50%, an alpha angle of more than 50 in about 40%, labral tears in about 50%, cartilage damage in about 40 to 50%, and a reduced head neck ratio in about 30 to 35 or 30 to 40% cases. So the advantages of doing a safe surgical dislocation for treatment of AFAI is that it essentially takes care of your trochanteric issues, it takes care, it's, it causes a relative lengthening of the functional region of the neck and the lever arm of the hip. It optimizes the abductor biomechanics and it is associated with correction of anti and extra articular impingements as well. And you can do a labral reconstruction associated with coxa profunda and you can address the posterolateral cam lesions as well. So the GAN surgical hip dislocations, the how is very difficult to go through in its entirety in a 10 minute session, but I will just walk us uh, through the basic procedure. So the, basically the, the philosophy of GANS is essentially to take care of the medial circumflex uh, uh, femoral arteries and the anterior branch of the medial circumflex femoral arteries, which are basically responsible for the blood supply to the head of the femur. And you take a posterolateral approach, you take down certain fibers of the abductors, uh, that is the gluteus medius, along with either a Z step cut or uh, a three to five millimeter cut of the trochanter, thereby anteriorly exposing the hip, as you see on the picture on the right side. And the most important thing in this uh, basic technique is the Z shaped capsulotomy, which will actually expose the rim of the acetabulum as well as prevent uh, any damage to the vascular supply of the head. 
And once one nun has done that, the hip is exposed anteriorly. And that is the hip exposed on the uh, picture on the lower left side. Once that is done, the bumps and the bump pec knee are either shaved off or burred off. And one can also take off the damaged or flipped cartilage lesions so as to get a nice, uh, a, a stable, uh, unfibrillated cartilage astabulum and a comfortable, clean coverage of the head of the femur. And once that is done, the hip is closed and put back, and the trochanter can be fixed with two cannulated can, 6.5 cannulated cancellous screws. Normally, the size which would go in would be about 70 or 75 depending upon the uh, morphology of the patient. So the contraindications when not to do a safe surgical dislocation would be usually patients, elderly patients, more than 40, 45, 50 years, extensive cartilage damage, anterior hip subluxations, and anterior and posterior cartilage damage with where you see a coup contra coup type of injuries and smokers where the incidence of trochanteric non-unions are high. So you don't want to go into the anterior hip subluxating cases because you don't want to create a potential global instability both anteriorly and posteriorly in these hips which have extensive cartilage damage. The rehab protocol post uh, uh, a safe surgical dislocation, essentially mobilization starts on day one. We start with passive and active internal and external rotation exercises, take the hip through range of motion and CPM for about six hours a day for six weeks. We can do stationary cycling at uh, starting at two weeks and touchdown weight pairing initially at one month with hip flexion limited to 90 degrees with hip abductor strengthening exercises and uh, avoidance of high impact sport activities for up to six months. The complications when going in osteonecrosis, if one damages the blood supply to the neck and if one is not careful with the uh, capsulotomy of the neck, Femoral neck fractures, if one is, does an overzealous uh, trochanteric uh, uh, resection or causes a damage to the neck or neck trochanteric junction. Trochanteric new unions, if the uh, trochanteric flip is not fixed adequately and securely. Sciatic nerve injuries have been observed in a few cases as in Sink et al's uh, study of 334 safe surgical dislocations on 302 patients. Heterotopic ossifications, essentially, we don't see a lot of HO uh, in our country, but yeah, I believe the Western world has a lot of heterotopic ossification. And this particular study also showed uh, some cases uh, of uh, thromboembolic disease. Now, coming to another treatment uh, modality, which is the reverse periastabular osteotomy for treatment of FKI. And the basic indication for doing a reverse PAO is uh, if you have a patient with a positive crossover sign and a true astabular retroversion, which means that you either have a defective rim posterior or superiorly and posteriorly, or you have a hip which does not have the residual and the, the requisite antiversion to house a stable, well-balanced hip with uh, adequate uh, balancing of the vertical and horizontal offsets. And in these patients, one would uh, clinically recognize an ischial spine sign a positive crossover sign, the posterior wall sign, and naturally the approach to take would be uh, a smith peterson approach. And those are the figures where you could uh, uh, see the smith peterson approach where the hip is uh, hip and the suprastabular region is exposed up to the level of the uh, level of the triradiate cartilage. And then you perform an osteotomy and you do a reverse uh, orientation of the astabular socket so as to give posterior superior coverage. And once that is done, you can fix the osteotomy with two screws from the eyelid blade into the supraastabular fragment and also screws from the supraastabular fragment to the eyelid uh, blade, which causes a good enough fixation and allows healing in the presence of uh, a protective uh, uh, protection from mobilization and weight bearing. So the mobilization is started early uh, for six weeks, starting on post-operative day one. The weight bearing is restricted for one and a half to two months. And once we do start weight bearing, it is restricted to touchdown weight bearing. And subsequently, physical therapy is focused on one, achieving range of motion, two, strengthening the hip stabilizers and the core muscles, and three, functional rehabilitation of these patients. So the third thing we need to do is trimming off the entire uh, mixed combined pincer and cam lesion, 
or a mixed lesion through a direct anterior approach or a mini open approach for a femoroastabular impingement. The basic indication being more anterior or even sometimes anterior and, and slight anteroposterior uh, lesions. And the treatment advantages essentially means that we are not disrupting the trochanter and the abductor mechanism. We are not risking the patient to trochanteric nonunion and abductor lurches. And uh, if subsequently these patients do progress to uh, uh, secondary osteoarthritis of the hip, for them not to have a significant abductor insufficiency. And then again, these approach would be the verified Smith-Peterson approach. These patients would be subjected to crutch weight bearing for six weeks, followed by a physical therapy, which starts after the six weeks, and then return to full activity in about four to six months. The direct anterior approach, essentially, the reported complications are the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, uh, injury to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Sometimes transient femoral nerve palsy is because of uh, retractions uh, due to the procedure. Disadvantages are there is no added benefit to hip scopy, so why do an open procedure? The amount of visualization of the central compartment is limited. And there is a relative inability to address posterior postrolateral pathologies. So the take homes would be that FAI is a common cause of hip pain, which essentially involves three types of lesions, the cam pincer and the mixed, and sometimes mixed morphologies like combined dysplasias and FAI. Hip scopy and open surgeries are successful modalities of treatment and the jury is slightly shifted towards better results in the short to medium, medium term on with hip arthroscopy. And certain complex combined procedures do require more open procedures than hip arthroscopy for the simple reason of giving a naked eye vision for the same. But the, there are four ongoing randomized control trials and the jury is still out on the issue whether an open procedure is better or a hip arthroscopy has uh, constantly better long-term outcomes. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir, for your great talk. Uh, next, I would like to invite our international faculty, Dr. Prakash Chandran, a uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon performing hip and knee replacement surgeries, Wellington Hospital, uh, in UK. Over to you, sir. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. You may yeah, great. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, um, Dr. Kalia and his team for putting this program together and um, inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, I'll be talking about um, labral tears and arthroscopic management. Uh, in line with the other talks which the earlier speakers have made, I think this, this falls in line. There will be a bit of overlap between the speakers so, because it's a very... Uh, very complicated topic and also um, hip joint is as a whole uh, manifest with a lot of symptoms together. So if you look at the labrum as such, uh, simple surgical anatomy, it's a fibrocartilage insulin, it has a triangular cross section, but if we look at it in a bit more detail, the posterior aspect of the labrum is a bit more bulbous and it's more lip-like. So there is a subtle difference uh, in the labrum itself in the in the front, top, and in the back. So that's a salient feature of the labrum. And if you look at the labrum uh, surfaces, it's got three surfaces. One is on the articular surface. And if you look at the surface of the labrum, it actually continues with the articular surface of the cartilage. So there is no clear demarcation. If you go inside and have a look, you cannot very clearly tell where the difference is. And there is a capsular surface, uh, which is on the opposite side. And the base, if you look at the base, a spike of the acetabular bone actually projects into the labrum, which adds to the stability. So the labrum actually has a portion beyond the bone as well. The other um, important detail about the labrum is, if you look at the orientation of the fibers in the labrum, the collagen, in anterior and superior aspect, uh, principally the fibers are arranged parallel to the rim. So they are running circular and parallel. But when you look at them posteriorly, there are more transverse fibers, which means they are anchored to the bone more 
than in the anterior and superior aspects. That's why you probably might have noticed most of the tears happen in the anterior or the superior aspect of the labrum where they get separated from the bone. You know, for people who go in and have a look, this is a more common pattern which we see. The other a key point about the labrum is if you look at the uh, blood supply and the nerve endings, you know, we always compare with the meniscus, but with labrum, the blood supply and the free nerve endings were seen in all the parts. That means right up to the very uh, tip of the labrum, which essentially means that it is quite sensitive. And also there is good room for healing because it's got a good blood supply. So this, this differentiates the labrum from the uh, meniscus as, a, as an intraarticular cartilage. A function, the key function of labrum is it acts as a seal um, within the joint. So it produces an intraarticular uh, compartment which uh, helps in weight transmission and distribution. So if you have a, an intact labrum which establishes a seal, it also helps to distribute the weight within the uh, hip joint. Okay, so if we come to the tears, so if you look at the tear uh, in the labrum, the tear usually is initiated secondary to one of these reasons. You know, there has to be a reason why a, a, a stabular labrum has to tear. Most commonly, uh, FAI, which I think has been covered quite extensively in the earlier talks. The trauma, simple trauma, sports injuries can cause um, tear in the labrum. The displacement of the hips where if there is a shallow acetabulum or if there is a smaller centroid jangle, you can have a lot of pressure on the labrum while weight bearing, they can cause to tear. The capsular laxity and degeneration. So if, if you have a tear in the acetabulum, there has to be one of these associated regions um, which um, kind of led, leads to the tear. Coming to the diagnosis, once again, I think it's been covered in the earlier talk. You have a very specific history for labral tears, either one of the uh, either injury or a FAI type picture, they will have a sharp catching mechanical symptoms. If it is an isolated labral tear, it will be like a meniscus. They come with sharp catching activity related symptoms, uh, which catches and then it lasts for a few seconds and then continued ache for a few days and settles down, which can be quite repeated. Uh, this can be elicited in the history and the clinical evaluation. Once again, you do the tests for impingement, mainly you're stressing the um, labrum by flexion and rotation to see which part of the labrum is um, uh, damaged and uh, you can elicit those symptoms. Imaging, uh, I think there was a talk on imaging or how to um, evaluate the uh, FAI. Similar to that with the labrum particularly, we use MRI. Uh, plain MRI itself has quite limited value because uh, it doesn't pick up the tear in the labrum because of the pressure. So even though there is a tear in the labrum, the tissue is so oh, tightly approximated against each other due to the pressure, you cannot see the, uh, the cleft or the, the defect within the labrum. Sometimes you can use an MR arthrogram, which allows the dye or the contrast to go between the tears. Once again, it's of uh, limited use. So a lot of surgeons are moving away from doing these um, tests and they're basically relying uh, on clinical presentation itself but they are useful to exclude other type of pathology or to identify other pathology like FAI or if there's a cam lesion or if there is a loose body or things like that. So it's important that we do these um, investigations. Uh, this is how a typical MR arthrogram will look. You know, if you see the coronal view, you can see there is a tear in the labrum. It's actually subluxed it's, it's into the joint between the surface. You can see it's kind of rolled inside. So which is a, a classical uh, uh, picture or you can get um, the other views, you can see uh, here, uh, clearly the labral um, tissue is separated from the acetabular attachment. Uh, it can come in various configurations. This is a clean tear. There can be degeneration, cystic changes in the labrum, and you can define or delineate the extent of involvement on these scans. So MR arthrogram uh, is reasonably useful, but once again, it's quite limited uh, depending on the type of tear. Uh, there is an MRI classification, probably for academic purposes. I don't think there is any clinical, um, you know, extension to this uh, classification. When we come to management uh, of the labral um, tears, non-surgical obviously is the first line of management. As we know, it's got good blood supply and nerve supply, good healing potential. So you can try, depending on um, uh, what the patient is presented with, how early, uh, rest, physiotherapy, activity modification, and you can give it a chance to heal. 
if the conservative management fails, then you got surgery, mainly arthroscopic. We can deal with all the most of the labral pathology arthroscopically. Uh, either we can debride it or we can repair it or we can reconstruct it. So those are the three more common forms of intervention we do uh, on the labrum. So when it comes to um, the labral tissue itself, there is a lot of emphasis on preserving the tissue as much as we can. If there is a repairable tissue, they say repair and keep the tissue because it can heal and it also helps to establish a, a seal around the femoral head. If the tissue is irreparable, if we can, they say you can reconstruct because they've shown better results with uh, repairing and retaining the tissue uh, than with um, debridement. If you look at the technique, I think Tarun has gone through the technique quite um, uh, in detail. Uh, I'll just briefly touch on the technique. So this is my setup. You know, I have an image intensifier on the on the right side. You got an image intensifier in the middle. There is a you know, stacker on this side, and your instruments are laid laid out. So we, you need an access kit, and you need your scope. Uh, you need your shaver. You need a wand, and you need some pump to put some pressure into your fluid. Uh, you distract the hip, uh, the technique has been well um, kind of discussed earlier. And then you establish a first portal. The Tarun has spoken about the, the triangle where you want to get your second portal in, then put your needle um, and establish your portals. So once you establish the portals, I'll just cover the labrum. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a classical picture of a labral tear. Normally when you go in and you see, you can see bruising over the labrum um, in the area where actually it is attached to the bone. And then the area where it is more paler, it's usually separated from the bone. Just indicates that there is still blood flowing through this part and there is inflammation going on in this portion of the labrum. You can see the, the cartilage uh, on the undersurface, which is kind of averted. Even though on the top or the sinual side, it still looks intact. That is a, a clear delineation separation from the underlying bone. So if you look at them, it can be a bit more chewed up like this, you know, a lot of fibrillation, separation from the um, undersurface, you can probe them or it can appear like this. You can see from these pictures clearly um, the symptoms can be mechanical because these loose bits of tissue gets caught in the hip as the hip rolls and they have specific um, catching or locking symptoms which you can relate to, uh, to these um, kind of appearances when you go in. Or it can be completely chewed up like this, where you, you cannot clearly define the label tissues. So you can see uh, uh, these are a few examples of what a, a classical label tear uh, looks like. So how do you manage once again? You debride them, you repair them, or you can reconstruct them. So if it is chewed up like this completely, then you can debride them, make them nice and smooth. Purely be, uh, you're preventing it from getting caught into the joints. So they, they are better. You know, you're losing labral tissue, but you're making them better symptomatically. If it is the, like this, you can debride whatever loose bits are and try and retain as much labrum as you can. So you can push it back. You're pulling it out of the joint, putting it on the lip of the uh, labrum and then make it nice and smooth so that it doesn't um, catch into the joint and you're establishing some form of a, a rim. Uh, in, this, uh, in this case, you can uh, see so you, you also had a cam lesion. So you excise the cam, uh, take the uh, tissue bone, which is impinging and then you repair the labrum and you establish the seal. So this is a, this is a, a classic of FAI type surgery. So if you look at the, I've got a small video of um, the um, labral repair. So this, this is one which I uh, did, oh, what happened to this? Just la two weeks ago, oh, wherein, uh, so if you look at the um, labrum, it was, he is only 34, so he had a significant pain in his hip groin and he was in fact limping into the clinic. So when you go in, you can see that there is labral tissue. Uh, it, is, it is a bit uh, chewed up, it is a bit degenerate. You can see it is separated from the bone and in the front it is almost kind of um, chewed up and rolled in, but it still looks intact. And you get through the whole of the joint, the anterior side looks fine. You can go all the way down. And you can also your video is not visible. Sorry to oh, it's, oh, it's not playing. Okay, sorry. Oh, let me see. Can you see now? Hello? No. No, the video is not playing? No. Uh, is it on separate screen? Maybe you'll have to uh, share the other screen where the video is. Oh, is it? Okay, I'll share the other screen. Yeah, it is on a separate. It is, I had linked it to this one. Okay, I'll, I'll share the other one. Just one minute. Sorry. 
So you can stop sharing this one and you can share that at the screen. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll share that one. One minute, sorry. So, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Can you see the video now? Hello? We can. Yeah. yeah, we can see that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, if you look at this one, yeah. So, this is the, this is the case I did around three weeks ago. He was 36. He had significant uh, pain in his hip. He was limping into the clinic. Uh, and when we go in, you can see the labrum is completely chewed up all around. But it's only in the front and in the, in the top, superior and anterior aspect. So if you go right up to the anterior side, it's intact. You can see the cleft, cleft there. That's the fovea, which looks fine. And then on the posterior side as well, you can see the labral tissue looks quite normal there. You can see there's a, there's a nice continuation with the articular surface. But if you come to the top, it's completely chewed up. There is, you can see that there is a separation uh, between the labrum and the articular surface. And also within the articular, you can see there is a wave sign. You can see if you push down, uh, there is a subtle wave sign, which means there is slight kind of delamination from the underlying bone. So in this one, once again, you can debate, you know, whether to keep this tissue or to take it off. Uh, so I decided let's keep whatever we can. So you you take a shaver and um, burr and just burr the uh, surface, uh, and then um, you place some anchors. So you can you can use whatever anchor forms you are comfortable with. So you make a hole for the anchor. So I start with a hole. Uh, then make sure you, you it's not into the joint itself. So you far you're far enough so that it's not into the joint, uh, and then you can uh, use any form of. Um, a suturing technique which you have. I use this gun, which uh, just fires a suture through the labrum. Uh, once it, you hold it with a like a forceps and then it fires through it. Uh, and then you, yeah, so it goes through the labrum like that. And then you can feed an anchor to it and push it into the hole. Uh, this um, anchor has got a, a dial. So you just dial the, uh, the handle so it will make the... Um, so it can tighten or put tension on your suture. It depends, you know, when when a tissue is quite thin like this, I don't know if you understand, it's like a, you're trying to fit a tire onto a, a rim. So the last bit is, is the most difficult bit to pull it back to the rim. So you have to use a lot of force to pull it back. And they tend to relax a bit as well. So you, you have to put a lot of tension and try and pull it back up to the bone. Uh, because it's been in that position for long. So, yeah, so that's the anchor um, fired. And once you've fired the anchor, um, so you can see that the, the tissue is now kind of back to the to the area where it should have been. Then you fire another, uh, Which uh, another anchor. The anchor. Sorry, hello? Which portal are you using for the anchor? Anchor, these are peak anchors, you know. The, Which portal are you using? Yeah, I'm using the, uh, I use normally two or three portals. This is the anterior portal and the anterolateral portal. Okay. So you can come from the front. Then sometimes I also use the, uh, the DIST portal as well, if it is on the lateral or more laterally. So you can fire uh, another anchor and then you can, um, obviously the same technique, you, you get your anchor in, you can tighten your, um, uh, sutures, put tension on the anchor, and then you, you place it there. And then, and then you, can, you can dial, this anchor has got a dial on it. These are made by Smith & Nephew. So you can, you can actually roll it, put tension on it, and then you can um, finish it. So that, that then comes back nicely. So you can, even after the anchor is going in, you can actually pull it up to, to get to your uh, tension. Okay, and then you can debride all the loose bits around. So you're trying to get back and keep as much as labral tissue as you can. Obviously, it doesn't look normal, but at least he has got some labrum, which will uh, provide some kind of a, a seal to his um, ICEP. Okay, so that is, I think I, I had time to show you probably just that. Oh, let me share my other screen now. So yeah, so that's the that was a short video of the um, 
repair. Uh, then comes the reconstruction. Uh, so once uh, the labral tissue is kind of completely damaged, either you debride and leave it alone or you can reconstruct it. You can part reconstruct or total reconstruct. Commonly they use uh, ITB. Uh, they roll it up and then they put it along the labral tissue or they can use hamstring tendon. You know, people are more used to taking grafts from the hamstring tendon for ACL, so they can use the same tendon. In summary, um, the key points are acetabular labrum has good network of blood vessels and nerve endings, which means they've got a good healing potential. So you try and retain or repair um, than uh, excision. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your excellent talk. Uh, without any further delay, uh, our next topic of presentation is uh, minimally invasive periastabular osteotomy. And I would like to invite Dr. Shiva Shanmugam Raju. Uh, he is from the Department of Orthopedics, uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Division, St. Louis, uh, USA. Hi. Yeah. Hello, sir. I'd like to share. Yes, sir. Can, can you see me? Yes, sir. Yeah. The presentation is visible, sir. Okay. All right. Hi. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kalia. So today, like I'm like, it's only been 10 minutes. I will try my best to explain our technique. So I'm originally, just briefly about me, myself. Uh, I'm originally from India, as you guys know. I did my med, uh, med school orthopedics um, in, from Madras Medical College. Then I did hip preservation fellowship with Dr. Omar. Uh, that's where I learned this technique and I'm in practice in the US for four years. So, uh, so <clears throat> we did not talk much about the uh, evaluation of hip dysplasia, but I, I kind of like to give a better view, uh, view or like what are the things you need to consider before like choosing a patient for any kind of like osteoporosiotomy. All right. So clinically, like most important thing I would like to uh, important is bait and scores, the laxity of the patient, then range of motion. As you guys know, any kind of like labral pathology, it's a clinical diagnosis. So you do like impingement sign or fiber, whatever the sign you'd like to, you know, you do make sure like you, then you make sure the pain is coming from the hip. But once you decide to move to the next level, if you decide to go for like surgical route, these are the things. Uh, so hip, <clears throat> especially rotation in hip flexion, especially internal rotation in hip flexion that gives an idea, especially if, for example, if the hip flexion is like five degrees in a borderline case, um, um, then it, you kind of like thinking more, more in terms of FAA pathology, but if the same patient in hip flexion, internal rotation in hip flexion, if it's more than like 20 degree or 30 degree, it's a borderline hip dysplasia. In those cases, those are, that's, that's the key differentiating point, especially in a borderline situation, dysplasia versus FAI. Then hip, hip examination neutral or in extension uh, to assess the uh, femoral version. So it's like, as you guys know, like it's it's more important to uh, assess both sides of the um, joint. So both can contribute to some uh, some form of dysplasia or uh, dysplasia. So for example, more femoral antiversion combined with uh, open anterior stubble uh, version uh, makes the joint worse, even though the lateral coverage can be good. So that's the clinic that's why the clinical important uh, examination is very important in that level then when it comes to radiological standardized hip x-rays usually standing x-ray that is standardized that's very important as you know by any pelvic tilt or any rotation can throw you off even the normal hip you can make you can we can me measure the angles and make it like a dysplasia similarly you can create retroversion just by throwing like if the pelvic tilt is off that's very very important then i use the mri for evaluation, basically rule out other pathology if the patient is younger. Uh, but often, like you know, it's, it's as you know, it's like a clinical diagnosis. But once in a while, you want to see if there is a labral true labral tear. Uh, so then I use MR orthogram. But if the older patient, I use uh, MRI degenerate, like above 30, you know, so 45. Those those cases that you can assess the cartilage damage better with the degenerative MRI, then you can say, hey man, he's already 45. You want to do go for a PAO, or you can want to go for total hip replacement. Those kind of talks you have to make here. Uh, so then for surgical planning and the assessment of the stabler and the femoral version, 
city pelvis with 3D reconstruction is very important. So like I, I told briefly about a stable version femoral torsion. So this like usually at three o'clock, uh, equatorial stable version, you measure it in an axial cut. Uh, so normally if you assume like, you know, and, and like, you know, 15, 20, in this case it's 30. So that means it's anteriorly open. Similarly, femoral version. Uh, so uh, femoral version relation to, to the uh, posterior condylar axis. Uh, so it can, like when you combine, it can make things worse. For example, if the femoral antiversion is more, for example, 35, 40 degrees, uh, when, when, you, when the acetabular is deficient anteriorly, <coughs> when you combine, it makes things even worse. So you, you have to look at the picture globally. So in this case, like especially the to assess the anterior coverage better, uh, I think you need 3D CT. So if you, in this um, uh, CT, 3D CT on your right, you can see like, you know, most of the hip, like even though the lateral coverage appears like, you know, pretty close, uh, probably at a borderline 2025, but it's anteriorly pretty much it's open. So 3D is very important to assess the deficiency, usually uh, where the real deficiency. So once we finish with the assessment, you come to the diagnosis of dysplasia, it needs some bony realignment. Then we'll go to the, um, we talked about this, uh, uh, PAO part. So I usually do it in two stages. Uh, so I like first stage, I do hip arthroscope. I do regular, like an uh, um, st standard approach. I'll have a case example. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, then basically hip hop, it's like, it can be like in the borderline cases, it can be diagnostic, like, you know, or maybe like a reinforce your diagnosis. For example, if there is a hypertrophic labrum or hypertrophic um, or the pattern of the cartilage tear, uh, that like that can re reinforce your thinking. Hey, it's displaced. It's not just FAI in you know, borderline cases. And then you take care of cam lesion. Uh, you do that part first part. You take care of that. Then I like it. so. We usually I usually if I don't do any micro fracture, I make them um, uh, weight bearing is tolerated. If I don't do a, any cartilage uh, 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 repair, so two three so they will start moving. And then two three weeks later, we we'll plan for a PAO. So. So PO, as you guys know, it's 1998, uh, Dr. Gans has described this through the Smith-Peterson approach. But the problem with this is like it's a steep learning curve. So a lot of guys try to, you know, come around it. Uh, so like, you know, so, you know, triple osteotomy was there even before, uh, but uh, because we are violating the column, both columns, then that's, what, that's why Gans came up with the concept of uh, this, uh, uh, type of PAO and it has become very popular. But so to like the, similarly at the same time, late nineties, uh, a guy named O'Hara uh, developed this Birmingham interlocking pelvic osteotomy. And it's like, a, it's kind of like a modified uh, triple osteotomy. But the key is here, you make the cuts at the angles like um, um, uh, based on the sciatic notch, then you rotate the fragment anteriorly, then like or flex the fragment anteriorly and you can with minimal rotation you can achieve the same correction so but the problem with this one was like there was a high um rate of uh ischial non-union but it's it, it's kind of like easily reproducible and uh, the learning curve is not safe because it's two incision technique and you do most of those um uh, uh, things under vision so this is like how he flex, like, you know, so you, you kind of like it, 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 interoperatively, it helps you. In Gantz, you have to rely on radiology a lot, but here you, you make the cutters and angles. So you know how much, like whether there is really, you are flexing the fragment or really rotating the fragment. And also you can like uh, clearly lock the fragment so that like there is good bony opposition that helps you uh, with early uh, weight bearing. So uh, Dr. Womer kind of like trained in both approaches. I was a fellow at the time. Uh, so um, so he kind of like came up with this idea, why can't, why can't we combine this? So uh, so as you know, in the, so the only thing is gone since two, like a single incision, you do everything in the front of the front. Here we make two incision, I'll go into the detail. So the cut, this is in the diagram, you can see two different cuts. This is our, the yellow line is our cut. And uh, the red line is typical uh, Bernie's cut. Okay, so we'll go into the detail a little bit uh, that can help you understand uh, our technique. So uh, our technique is two incision, one in the front, one in the back, posterior, and start in the lateral portion, with the, uh, then we move to supine. Uh, we do single draping, uh, 
the, all the cases will use TXA and all the cases will use uh, cell saver. All right, so posture cut in lateral position. So here, you like you push in the patient lateral. So then you kind of like use the typical posture, posture approach uh, through the glute max, then expose the start external rotators uh, originating from the <coughs> particular uh, infracartilar area up to the ischial spine. So you kind of like once you expose that, once you expose the um, glute max, I mean, split the glute max, identify the sciatic nerve. That's the key there. So you, you, you see the nerve when you make the cut. You identify the nerve, you move either medial or lateral. So you move the nerve, then you make the cut. You can use a saw for the this part of the cut, but for going up, I usually use some kind of like a uh, acetone. Uh, so this is our cut this like you know at the beginning i would say is rather than like you know you, you can start with a little bit longer incision for a better visualization uh, but as you grow like in uh, couple, like probably five six cases you can try with the uh, smaller incisions so then that, then we make the patient supine then you do the cuts anterior cuts then you do the pubic cut next then you do the superior cut then retros double cut that connects with our uh, ischial cut uh, so i'll so I'll go to that. So okay, this is a case example. Uh, so this is our my kind of like sheet sheet. So she's kind of like an 18-year-old female, 4 a step, hip pain, DD gauge. So past impingement sign, taper signs, hip pathology. If you look at the LC and social, it's like borderline. But this is the case I was talking about. Like so, if you look at her uh, uh, internal rotation and flexion, it's very high. Whenever you see that much high internal rotation, so you mean you know it's not impingement that's alone causing the problem. If so, you, so once you once you once you clarify, then you uh, you confirm with an CT scan. You see that how much the acetabulum is open in the anterior leg. It's 20 degree anterior and and the femoral torsion is 30 degree 30 degree anterior. So it's a clearly it's a case of borderline dysplasia. If you do a hip arthroscopy alone in these cases, it would eventually fail. The, the another factor that you should find to use the patient is only 18. So the anger the patient when they have a borderline, uh, so then you, you kind of like error on the side of uh, um, um, a bony realignment procedure rather than just arthroscopy alone. Uh, so I chose the case because this is kind of like a dilemma. If there is a frank dysplasia, you, you don't have to think about anything, just go in there, do a PAO after uh, treating the intraarticular pathology. So uh, this is her imaging. You can see so her LC is. 25 social 9 version and we talked about you can see most the anteriorly see you see that it's like a standard upright when zero degree upright you see that one like very minimal anterior head is covered laterally it's like reasonable and also if the ct confirms it like most of the head is anterior. so she's kind of like deficient anteriorly so uh so for hyperscopy i use point postless uh, and uh, bed the strike it has a bed that <coughs> i use I do my hyperscopy like in 10 to 15 degree of Tundlenburg. I usually only use two portals, uh, peritrochondric and modified mid -anterior. I can do most of the jobs in these two portals. This case she had, did not have any tad, just hypertrophy. Uh, we did, just did the uh, femoroplasty and closed the capsule. So, so then let's go into the technique. So this is kind of like, you know, the position, you can see like a hammock situation. So you see the hammock. So that helps once you finish with the ischial cut, we kind of like pull on that, then take the posterior post away, then you kind of like pull the patient, then you can uh, make the patient supine. But at the beginning, like my nurses were not like, you know, uh, not very comfortable with that. So I, I, I used to do two drapings. Uh, I do finish this one, then I flip the patient supine, then I drape again and do this. So. The, for the posterior cut you, incision, you find the tip of the trope, find the skill uh, tuberosity, inferior part of tuberosity, draw a line, like your incision is going to be at the like um, anterior one third, posterior two third junction along the gluteal fibers, find the sciatic nerve. Uh, then you, you do that, um, then put the, uh, you do the cut, uh, ischial cut open with either saw, then extend it upward. Uh, like a retro for the retro stubular cut to connect from the top uh, using a, um, acetone. Then you can see the cut on the right. You see here, uh, you can see the cut I made. Uh, but you, you, for this step, you don't need fluoroscopy. You do everything under visualization. So then in supine position, uh, kind of like one centimeter lateral to the uh, iliac crest, you make the incision. As, you, as I said earlier, when you're starting, 
start with a bigger incision uh, then you, as you grow uh, more confidence you can like go with like small incision for exposure and so i like i don't do an osteotomy of the sis i take down the sartorius along with the inguinal ligament then you expose the inner part of the uh, ilium then you then you make two cuts uh, so you do the uh, you do the um, uh, pubic cut under fluoroscopy flex up the hip to like 70 degrees relax the psoas so gently <coughs> pass the astutum, uh, chest medial to the teardrop, uh, so that you will have like a wider bone. I would like to do that closer to the teardrop because you you will have like a wider bone. You get a, like a very good, nice healing. Then other top two cuts like uh, centering the center part of the sciatic notch. You make the horizontal cut, then then retrotibular uh, stubular cut. Finally, I do that and like superior cut. So superior cut, you can decide where you want, like, you know, if you want to like a more correction, more flexion, you can make it steep, steeper, then you, you can flex the uh, fragment more, uh, more um, to get the, the, the correction. That's us. That's, that's the uh, previous one was an example. Now I'm back to the case I did. So this is how, like, after the correction, uh, you see that, like, the anterior wall, posterior wall nicely matching. This is our um, pubic cut. Uh, then you can see the collar line is still intact. That means the column is still intact. Then you can see now, so see here, uh, this is our ischial cut. You see that fragment has nicely rotated. This is the, like, this is often hinges in, uh, because you don't see that in uh, Gans type or sciatomy. This is where it hinges very often. Uh, and it may not rotate most of the time. So you kind of like, instead of tip, rotation of the whole fragment, we are just will be uh, flexing or this like uh, flexing the fragment many times in the Gansas time. Or sometimes may, or you may have to multiple times revisit that corner to get the fragment moved, especially when there is, an, uh, uh, you need a large correction. So this, uh, then I do like intraoperative fluoro, I mean, sorry, radiograph, just to make sure our correction, everything is good. Uh, after this acetamide, it's everything looks good. Then we have fixed it with the uh, screws. I use 5.5 five, um, cannulated screws. Uh, you can see the nice correction and the uh, layer public view. You can see that like, you know, that is like nice rotation. You see that like the fragment moved all the way that in, like says like there's a nice correction. Uh, in this view, you can, you can, especially on the right, you can see our cuts nicely. Uh, so this uh, three-month follow-up radiograph. Uh, I want deliberately wanted some more anterior coverage. So uh, because as we know, that she's anterior deficit, then you can see the retrotribular cut. But you see closely here because because of the cut or the angle, it, there is nice bony connection there on the top. That's what makes us like. Uh, um, this 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 is more stable uh, makes osteotomy more stable and we can allow early weight bearing that's different uh, from the other osteotomies. <laughs> As a six month follow up, uh, she, she's there is progressive healing and progressive filling in. And and the other consideration, many times if you flex up the fragment, uh, it makes the ASIS uh, prominent. I routinely like not routinely up to fifty percent. I like flex up and do a lateral X ray if there is impinging. Uh, I kind of we take down the ASIS, then reattach the uh, rectus uh, using some so sort of anchor. It's up to take a second. All right, so and like <clears throat> our PA was, I I strongly believe I think it, it like you know um, the learning curve is not steep. Um, uh, like you visualize everything, you can pre adequately plan where you want the cut to be, and I, I believe it's easily reproducible. Most importantly, you, every time, like you can early weight bearing, that's a thing. Is that it may not be a matter in India, people, people will listen to us, but here I think that matters. Uh, and the um, risk of sciatic nerve palsy is very low. It still it can happen when you're like moving the fragment. Um, like flexing a lot, it still it can impinge on the nerve. But if, since you see, you know, you did not cut the uh, nerve. Yeah. All right. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and such an elaborate presentation. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude our present session. Next, our speaker is Dr. Krunal Shah. He is the consultant and joint replacement surgeon 
working in Astha Joints Clinic, Surat, uh, Gujarat, from India. He'll be talking. Uh, he'll be taking us through our next topic, that is labral management in pincer FAI. Uh, actually, sir is not present with us today. Uh, hence, I'll be sharing the presentation. Thank you. Hello friends and I uh, thank Dr. Kalya and the whole organizing team of this wonderful uh, webinar and uh, which is uh, basically focused on adult hip reconstruction. My topic is even unique, it is labral management in pincer fibular femoral acetabular impingement. Friends, I'm Dr. Kunal Sa and I'm from Surat, Gujarat. Femoral acetabular impingement is a big risk factor for hip pathology and pain, specifically in young adults, uh, mainly between the age of 30 to around 45, 50. <clears throat> it was a Wagner who showed that 87% of patients with labral tear had underlying structural abnormalities. And Gans and colleague first time noticed that femoral acetabular impingement is a cause of hip pain and labral tear and early osteoarthritis. So basically, uh, grossly femoral acetabular impingement has been divided into two parts. It is one is scam and other is pincer many, many a times. In fact, majority of time it is overlapping. Since scam is uh, a bump on the hidden neck junction of the uh, femur and uh, I'm not going to cover that topic. Pincer is basically over coverage from the acetabulum which is impinging on the nape of femur and damaging both the labrum as well as chondral part of the uh, acetabular acetabulum acetabular labrum is extends beyond the bony socket of the acetabulum and it presents around the entire lunate surface of the acetabulum it is continuous with the transverse acetabular ligament inferiorly. It is a very important structure specifically because one uh, hip is more contained joint than compared to shoulder. If we talk about pincer, this is how pincer causes impingement. This is the movement of the neck ahead and uh, neck of the femur. And this is how the labrum is been crushed between the neck and over covered uh, head of the femur with the, the acetabular part and that is one of the reasons why the labrum as well as the cartilage on the edge of the acetabulum is being damaged. So this is how it has been damaged. Now anyway in femoral acetabular impingement one of the most common question is whether my diagnosis is correct the clinical diagnosis is mainly important from the history and the physical uh, examination. We need to understand that the concomitant disease, the core muscle injury, lumbar spine pathology, muscle strain also behaves the same way as the hip pathology. There is often a mixed picture of symptoms such as sacroiliitis, pervi, pelvic tendinitis, ischial or uh, bursitis. So from the history, we need to understand whether it is a traumatic or an insidious onset, whether it is a twisting or talking or subluxus and dislocation, associated fracture, any sports injury in a young adult, any jerk clamping down the stair. We need to ask whether it is a congenital or developmental, that is the developmental dysplasia of the hip, earthis, cafe, any other infection, PVNS, osteonecrosis, synovial chondromatosis. Those, these are all differential diagnosis of pain in a young adult around the hip joint. Confirming the source of pain is very important, whether it is a predominantly lateral that is around the trochanteric bursa or it is posterior which usually represent the radiculopathy or lumbar side or it is in the groin which is usually of a hip origin. Pain or a numbness in the groin down the leg, you know, some meralgia parasthetic or a lumbar radiculopathy can give you some time numbness and weeping. That is again very important to, uh, uh, build, uh, to differentiate. C sign is pathognomonic. And uh, usually I have seen many of our FAI patients, they are very classically uh, showing this type of, uh, uh, when we try to tell them to explain the pain, they usually show it by their uh, hand and in a C manner. And this is how it is uh, usually uh, been demonstrated. 
again confirming the source of pain history what causes the pain whether it was a twisting running prolonged sitting walking up till getting in or out of car at night and this all are very different type of uh, um, history for the hip pain Many patients do not follow the textbook. Combined back and groin pain, trochanteric can groin pain, gluteal and groin pain, groin pain but negative anterior impingement sign, echinite pain. You know, this, these are different type of mixed picture, and we need to differentiate whether it is purely hip in origin or it is uh, around uh, again uh, some other pathology associated with hip. Two classical impingement signs are. Anterior impingement is in which passive flexion to 90 degrees followed by post adduction and internal rotation as shown in this figure. And other is a fiber test in which flexion, abduction and external rotation is being done. It is basically for the posterior impingement and the, uh, the previous one is mainly for the anterior impingement. Sometimes we can inject also with the local anesthetist and we can confirm the diagnosis. X-ray, MRI, and CT scan to me are secondary to diagnosis. Of course, they are there to confirm the X-ray specifically is more important in CAM than in pincer. MRI, of course, important in pincer, and that suggests us whether there is any labral pathology or any chondral damage because of the over coverage of the uh, of the acetabulum. And CT scan again tells us whether there is any dysplasia, scapy, or any other pathology associated with. Uh, impingement. Second question. So that was regarding the first question. Is my diagnosis correct? Whether I'm confirmed, it is confirmed impingement, which is again very important to know because many a times there is other pathology as we discussed. Once it is diagnosed that yes, it is impingement, it is scam or it is um, pincer. The second very important question to be answered is do the patient's current symptoms and limitations warrant any surgical intervention? Because all the impingements, they do not absolutely uh, indicate any surgical inter intervention. If it doesn't hurt, do not operate. There is no role of uh, prophylactic femoroacetabular correction. And only possible exception is uh, uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis. Again, it is a very long topic to cover. But yes, Cafe, in some patients, we do do some prophylactic femoral acetabular impingement correction. But majority of them, only because it is present in the radiology and some symptoms elicited on the clinical examination, if there is no pain otherwise in the routine activity, we do go conservative. The third question important is, does this patient have osteoarthritis? Because there is no role of arthroscopy in osteoarthritis. If there is two millimeter rule, which was given by uh, Philippon and uh, usually it is uh, uh, it is measurement of the cartilage on the CT, MR and X-ray and it is not applicable to women and it is applicable it is again a debatable whether it is applicable or at all or not but it gives a generalized idea whether there is a reduction in the joint pain again there is no role of arthroscopy. The role of chondral restorative procedure is in very much a research-based uh, process right now, at least for the hip, and I personally do not have any experience in that. <clears throat> the fourth question is whether this patient has a dysplasia or not. Undercovered hips cannot be cured arthroscopically. This one it is not common with a pincer, more common with a cam. But yes, of course, if there is a dysplasia, then uh, we need to, again, uh, uh, rethink whether there is any intervention, arthroscopic intervention with help or not. Uh, there are different angles which you need to measure to confirm the dysplasia and uh, how much is the dysplasia. Again, that is debatable. It is more of comes under the uh, body of pediatric orthopedics and uh, I personally do not deal with the uh, periacetabular osteotomies or uh, open hip surgery. So, once it is confirmed that it is a dysplasia, and then I usually refer to my pediatric orthopedic colleague and they do the other needful things. And this is how uh, a pincer pathology looks. And I know it is not a very clear picture, but uh, this is what I got from uh, our uh, mobile. But this is how it looks like there is a completely torn labrum on the cartilage. And uh, this is one of our other picture in which there is what, what I wanted to show is this is a normal labral kept in the hip. 
so this is not a pathology and this much of the labral separation like in the uh, unlike uh, in the shoulder is very much present in the in the hip so uh, you need not to repair uh, this type of uh, separation you just need to leave it alone and to be very honest in all hip pathologies of pincer in which i do get a labral pathology i debride it uh, with a shaver i do not uh, repair it and this is how i have been trained it is debatable whether you need to repair the labrum or you can debride the labrum at least i can share my experience i have always debrided the labrum along with uh, uh, osteoplasty for the pincer and uh, never uh, ever i have repaired any labral pathology so again you can refer the literature for the various results of both uh, labral repair versus debridement and uh, it is more about osteoplasty and then actually uh, repairing the labrum or reconstructing there are few papers of uh, richard willer and mark philippon and guancha on even uh, reconstruction with the semi tendinosus graft of the labrum so this is uh, something which i have never attempted and uh, most of my patients are happy with labroplasty and uh, uh, osteoplasty of the pincer so again thank you very much for the patient listening thank you everyone uh, next in the lineup um, are some very interesting topics that is hip salvage and osteonecrosis of femoral heads uh, we here at our center we see a lot of osteonecrosis of the femoral heads especially in young age groups and hip salvage remains a very important uh, management for them next uh, is our topic that is hip salvage in early uh, osteonecrosis of femoral head for this i would like to invite dr sanjeev agarwal uh he is the consultant and joint replacement surgeon working in cardiff hospital uk uh sir you can start now i think he's not around uh then sir uh, we'll move to ahead with our next topic that is hip salvage in osteonecrosis uh, with collapse uh, and i would like to invite dr rb kalya he is an ad additional professor working in all india institute of medical sciences uh, rishikesh sir you can continue with yeah. the thank you so much okay so uh i'll be talking about uh, the hip salvage in patients who already have a collapse uh osteonecrosis of the femoral head leads to painful hip arthritis unfortunately it happens in young people and uh, there is a kind of an epidemic in our country because we get two three patients in every opd and uh, more often than not they come with end stage arthritis then it's a no brainer however there are certain hips which still have cartilage left on the tabular side and uh, we have been thinking very deeply of trying to salvage those uh, the problem that we face is that uh, the patient to come to us are very young and uh, doing a total hip in a 25 year old person is probably not my cup of tea and there is some amount of ambiguity in the decision making because uh, uh, the classification systems uh, usually don't tell us which are the ones in which we can do hip salvage and more often than not any collapse more than 2 mm uh, probably is uh, thought that the best procedure that we have for reconstruction is probably a total hip replacement uh, so when when we are looking at these patients uh, i really feel that i don't know what to do a lot of times i can either go and do a hip salvage or i can obviously do a total hip replacement which is more predictable uh, but these two choices are important because uh, if i do a hip salvage and it works uh, he's going to have a normal hip uh, for a long period of time hopefully at least in 70% of patients if i do a total hip replacement it's like a race against time in a young person it's going to fail eventually 
I don't know when, but probably after 10, 15 years, I will again be staring at a, a revision surgery, which is going to be more daunting than the primary. Definitely. So what's the evidence that we have? Uh, uh, the evidence we have is that mesenchymal chimal stem cells uh, do work. Uh, they need a proper kind of uh, harvesting and uh, proper preparation. And then they need a scaffold for them to work. They don't work with the injection directly. Uh, so if you can produce uh, structural support with the congruent joint surface and healthy cartilage, uh, and this can only be done by osteochondral allografts so because this is uh, a viable option. But it's mostly been used in osteochondral as if you can in small hip femoral head defects. Uh, it's not really been done a lot in osteonecrosis, and that is something that is daunting for us. There is no previous study, and there is hardly any data available with us. So, what really can we do? Uh, in the collapse stage, uh, uh, most of the defects are probably uh, about three centimeters, and the osteogonal grafts uh, can be done. Uh, they have to be allografts. What about oats? Uh, the problem with oats is that uh, it's limited by the quantity. So, you have probably a two by two area, then oats is uh, probably better. But uh, the kind of defects we get. Uh, what I feel is that we won't get enough oats uh, to fill that defect up there. Uh, what is the role of MRI? Uh, we did an interesting study in which uh, we found that if you measure the volume of the avascular necrosis area, uh, and if it's more than 25, uh, they would all collapse in one year. And regions which are smaller would not collapse or will progress very slowly. So in the regions in which yeah, you have more than 25% involvement of the head of the femur. Probably the old procedures like core decompression and vascularized fibula and all the other kinds of procedures for revascularization would ultimately lead to collapse happening in one year. So uh, there's no fun in doing a surgery which won't last even one year, but somehow uh, the science in this area is still evolving. So the preoperative MRI, you measure the volume on the AP and the exit cuts. And the old method was a curved angle. And what we found was that it is the volume which is more important than rather than the angle. And uh, if you have uh, a certain amount of uh, volume involvement, more than 25, probably it is wiser to wait for some time rather than subjecting a patient to surgery and then thinking about what happens when it collapses. So we need to quantify the size of the defect. And the best way to quantify the size of the bony defect is by measuring it on a CT scan. So that's what we do. We measure the CT scan and see where the defect is, what is the size of the defect. And then uh, we do a surgical dislocation of the hip, standard way, we visualize the collapse area, template the defect, prepare the bed for a graft. Uh, then we keep uh, fresh osteochondral allografts ready. Sometimes uh, we have uh, a lot of patients with neck femur coming to us. So we have a lot of uh, grafts available to us. And then it's like uh, doing the surgery uh, in front of your eyes. And it's like an art kind of a thing because you need to really figure out uh, what is the shape of the defect that you're taking. So, after you remove the cartilage, you really see the head you know, with the, the, the optimal sources right in front of you. So you make a few drill holes there and take the small piece of paper sterile and make a tracing out of it. And then you know, take out a tap from a head you know, exactly with the same kind of a you know, the design. It's not easily circular. It might be in a few asymmetric at certain places. So you mark with your uh, Small sterile pen where exactly you want to dial it up inside. So you make holes, put the graft on top, and then fix it up with three uh, herbert screws. So this is another patient, almost the same kind of defect. So this is a very large defect. I'm sure uh, oats is not going to work here. Two big for that. This is how we harvest and with a burr very carefully, exactly the same geometric shape and then fix it up with the uh, herbert screws. 
First well, so of rehabilitation that we've been following is that we allow the patient to sit, we keep the patient non-weight bearing because it's a cartilage procedure, and we use partial weight bearing for about three months, and then uh, we progress to full weight bearing on a case to case basis. So this is a post-operative uh, X-ray of a patient uh, who has just got this done, and this is a six months follow-up, no progression of further collapse, and this is an MRI showing satisfactory crack of the and this is an exit cut, and the HALICIP score has improved from 54 to 76. So take-home messages, uh, osteochondral allografts remain a viable option. It requires a bone bank, and it can be used carefully in young people with collapses, with good cartilage on the acetabulum side. Uh, there are risks and benefits with all we do, and probably this is uh, where uh, we need to look into because we have a peculiar problem of very young patients with collapsed hips and we're going to land up with arthritis if we don't do anything much. So it's not really the size of the staff which matters. It's the magic what it has in it that is more important. Putting in a total hip in a 25-year-old person probably is not my cup of tea. I would think about doing a grafting and probably healing. But yes, I do need uh, a patient who's committed and is willing to accept a few bad results because there is no 100% sure that this is going to really work. But if it works, probably that is the best that we can do. Thank you very much for a patient here. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, moving ahead with the pre presentation. Yeah, Sanjeev is there. Uh, okay, so. Sanjeev Agarwal. Yes, yes. Uh, so I would like to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Agarwal. He's a consultant joint Placement surgeon uh, working in Cardiff Hospital, UK. Sir, UK, please start your presentation. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me and see my presentation? Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, good. Thanks. So, sorry about that. I was supposed to be before the more advanced talk, but here I am. So, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Rup Kalia for asking me to participate in this. Uh, really delighted to be part of this excellent faculty. So we're going to talk about early osteonecrosis and how we deal with it in our center. Let's see, go to the next slide. There we are. So I work here in Cardiff, which is about 120 miles west of London. It's called the University Hospital of Wales. This is the hospital where I work. Uh, osteonecrosis, as we see in our practice, most it is relatively uncommon, I would say. The people we see are linked to alcohol, hip trauma, or steroids. And another group that we see is idiopathic osteonecrosis. Uh, before we start treating, we have to see how we classify these and we use the Steinberg classification. The figure and R classification came out about 40, 50 years back and was based on x-rays. Uh, the Steinberg includes MRI scan findings, so that's what we normally use. There is an ARCO classification and a Nymian classification as well, which uh, you can use if you like, but whichever works for you. So we'll stick with this Steinberg, and it's got six stages with a stage zero, which is a normal hip on a normal MR scan. So when we talk about early or pre-collapse osteonecrosis, we're talking about zero stage one and stage two. Stage three is when you start getting subchondral collapse, and that for me is gone beyond hip salvage, and then you are starting to look at more techniques which Dr. Kali has just talked about. So for the purpose of this talk, I'll restrict myself to stage one and two. Uh, our preoperative uh, evaluation includes x-rays and MRI scans. Uh, CT scan we do sometimes, and this is mainly to look for subchondral fractures. So people have, who have got a subchondral collapse, we would like to scan them with the CT and make sure there's no significant collapse before we try and preserve the hip. We still use the Kraboul angle. That was gain was came down a long time back. It was before the days of the MRI scans. And you look at the necrotic angle on the AP and lateral views. A combined angle more than 200 degrees carries a poor prognosis. Now, with MRI scans, you can use the similar uh, similar measurements on the mid coronal and the mid sagittal MRI scan, and the angle roughly you still take as around 200 200 degrees, which is the cutoff between a good or a bad prognosis. Now, what options do we have for early osteonecrosis? We can group them into three, pharmacologic, core decompression, or vascularized fibular graft. So we'll take each of them in turn, starting with the pharmacological options. 
So these are mainly bisphosphonates. There are, some people have tried aspirin and enoxaparin. Now, the use of these is based on the fact that uh, osteonecrosis could be a hypercoagulable condition, and using anticoagulants may help uh, preserving the femoral head. The evidence for these is very, very thin, and we don't use them. So we'll go on to the bisphosphonates, which really is something which has got more evidence linked to it. Now, the initial paper, or one of the initial papers that came out for bisphosphonates was by Manoj Ramchandra, and he works in London. But I think this paper was from his fellowship in Australia. They looked at 28 children and a 38 month follow up, and they found that bisphosphonates were helpful in people with osteonecrosis. These are mainly young, young people or children. Another paper, 2011, 40 patients, three year follow up, uh, three year treatment, 10 year follow up and they also found it was of benefit. But at the same time, there've been many other studies, and then a meta-analysis came out in 2018, which showed that there was no clinical benefit of using bisphosphonates in, uh, in osteonecrosis. Now, it might seem counterintuitive, but bisphosphonates do cause osteonecrosis of the jaw. So why are we using something which causes osteonecrosis of the jaw to treat osteonecrosis of the hip? I don't know the answer to that. So bisphosphonate is something that you can consider. The evidence I would say is relatively thin. The next thing, surgical option would be a core decompression. And that is something that we do offer in our center. Uh, essentially, the idea behind a core decompression is to make one or more tracks into the avascular part of the femoral head. What these tracks do is to number one, relieve the pressure within the femoral head, so relieve the intraosseous tension. And secondly, they provide a channel for the inflow of blood, inflow of vascularity. So when you make a channel, you can either combine it with injecting stem cells into it, or you can put a bone graft substitute into the tract. And these are various techniques which people have modified uh, regarding core decompression. Injecting stem cells is not new. It was, it was proposed by Hernigu in 1993. More commonly and more recently, people have been putting bone marrow mononuclear cells, which are called BMMCs. They provide a source of osteoblasts and also provide some BMP2. The source of these stem cells can be either from the iliac crest or you can get them from adipose tissue within the body. Iliac crest stem cells are slightly better quality. Adipose tissue stem cells, less morbidity, but less good quality. Now, again, there were multiple studies on core decompressions and mesenchymal stem cells. This is a selection of them, and these said that the mesenchymal stem cells work. You got to note that most of these are relatively small studies, so small number of patients, relatively short follow-ups. So you're looking at two years, and one study you had a five-year follow-up, but still relatively short follow-up, small number of patients. To counter this, there are many studies which say that the stem cells don't work. And again, I would say the evidence for stem cells is debatable. A uh, paper from LIM, 2013, 190 hips, probably one of the largest studies on this topic, five-year follow-up, and they did not find any difference with the use of stem cells. So evidence for stem cells, again, I would say is debatable. In our center, we do core decompression. We do not do stem cells, but we do put in a bone substitute and I think we should have an example of how we do this. So this is an illustrative case. This is a young person with osteonecrosis, femoral head, superolateral aspect of the femoral head, which is one of the commonest places for osteonecrosis. You can see it in the axial scans. And now the idea of drilling into the femoral head is that you have to get it into the area where the osteonecrosis is. Now you can see that area on the MRI scans, but you cannot see it on x-rays. So you have to try and localize it. And the way we localize is the same procedure as we used for pinning the slipped femoral epiphysis. So you triangulate and you draw a line along the AP view and along the lateral view. And where the lines cross is the angle where you need to go into the femoral head. So these pictures are actually from a slipped epiphysis patient, but this is the same principle in, you know, in general. So back to our patient with osteonecrosis, this is the x-rays you can see, you cannot see that lesion on the x-rays, which we could see on the MRI scans. So the guide wire goes in on the planned part of the femoral head. 
you check it under AP and lateral views. And then you can drill a hole which goes right up to the subchondral area. Once you've done that, you can put a curette. So the curette expands as it goes inside the femoral head and it helps to remove some of the other subchondral bone that you can't easily access. So this is the principle of how the curette works. And then once you've curetted that lesion, then you can put a cannula and inject a bone substitute, which looks a bit like this. So whether it does help or not, we, wait, the evidence for this is again fairly thin, makes you feel a bit better that you put something in there when you made a hole in the femur. As I said, you could put stem cells in there and they may have another, you know, some role to play in this situation. This is the follow-up of this patient. This is at two years, he's had both sides done. And up till that point, there was no collapse in, in the femoral head. Uh, the last thing is a vascularized fibular graft, which is the more posh version of a core decompression that involves taking a segment of fibula and you plumb the vascular blood su vascular supply of the fibula to the local blood supply, one of the iliac anastomoses. You do need a plastic surgeon for this or someone with microvascular expertise. I know it's popular in some parts of the US, but in the, in the UK, there are very few people who are doing vascularized fibulas for, court for avascular necrosis. So I have no experience with this. Uh, it was popularized by Urbaniac mainly. And then again, there are some centers with relatively small number of patients who talk about vascularized fibular grafts. So to sum up uh, for early vascular necrosis, the evidence for using anything, I think is fairly thin. You can use bisphosphonates. If you believe in that, you need about six months worth of treatment. Core decompression, relatively simple thing to do. It's a simple technique. Most of us are familiar with putting a guide wire in the femoral head, and uh, you can put some bone graft or some stem cells in that hole. Vascularized fibulas, if you've got the facilities, then that might be an option. So that's our take on uh, early avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir. That was an excellent talk. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude our third session. And uh, moving ahead, we have some case discussions lined up. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kalia would like to. Kalia, sir, please can session, sir. Yeah, thank you everyone. It's been an exhaustive session. We have been going on for more than two hours. So we'll just wrap it up very quickly. Uh, Dr. Orho, you, you please go ahead with your case that we have done and uh, very quickly present it. And let's uh, ask the faculty what would they do. Okay, please start. Thank you so much, sir. So I would like to uh, brief about this uh, case which we did. Uh, it is around uh, two years back we did uh, this case. So we have a around, we have around two year follow up for this patient. Uh, so I'm working with Dr. Kalia. I'm doing my MCH uh, under him in AIMS Rishikesh. Uh, so this 42 year old male, uh, he was a laborer by occupation. He presented with uh, presented to us with uh, uh, groin pain over the right hip, which was progressive for, for around six months. He had a previous history of a painful uh, hip condition for this left side, which was arthritic. Uh, so on local examination, we examined uh, uh, the patient and on examination of the right hip, there were no deformities which were evident uh, clinically. The patient had a full range of motion uh, of his right hip. Uh, however, when we did uh, the impingement test, we did the uh, flexion adduction and internal rotation test and the patient had a significant impingement test. Positive. Uh, so moving ahead, what will you do next? So the next step, uh, which uh, comes to our mind uh, is uh, some radiological investigations. Uh, so uh, moving ahead with the radiological investigations, first and foremost, we did some uh, preoperative radiographs that is uh, pelvic with both hip, AP ray. We found, found the arthritic hip, which was evident uh, clinically as well uh, uh, on the left side. And uh, over the right side, 
we identified radiologically that the crossover sign was present, which is uh, indicative of a retroversion of the astrogulum, which we usually find uh, in association with a CAM lesion. And uh, on uh, further uh, looking carefully, we identified a CAM kind of a lesion uh, for, on this patient, for this patient. We measured, uh, we also got the lateral views done and uh, on lateral views we measured the alpha angle uh, and this is uh, large in size and the alpha angle we found out to be around 60 degrees. We investigated him further we got some CT scan done uh, and we confirmed the uh, uh, cam kind of a lesion uh, for this patient and uh, we also identified the retroversion of the astabulum which is evident on this axle cut. Uh, we got a preoperative uh, MRI scan done and the patient was uh, identified to have a labral tear associated with a CAM kind of a lesion. Um, so this was the labral tear which is uh, uh, detected on the MRI scan. So what should be done next? Whether we should go ahead with an arthroscopic surgery or an open surgery? Uh, both has some pros and cons to it. Arthroscopic surgeries are usually said to have a, a less painful course of post-operative uh, period. And it is definitely a smaller kind of a surgery where we do a keyhole kind of an operation. And uh, uh, or that the other option is open surgery. Open surgery usually gives us a, a wider view of the overall picture. And we can identify the astabulum and it gives us a 60 degree kind of a view as well as we can uh, get a full uh, uh, visualization of the femoral head mm -hmm. as well as the neck part. So we moved ahead with our uh, the procedure that we selected uh, for this patient. We surgically uh, uh, operated the patient and we moved ahead with open surgery. We did a safe surgical dislocation as described by GANS. Um, it uh, allowed us to have a wider view. We did a trochanteric flip postrotomy and the excision of the CAM lesion. These are some of the intraoperative images. This is uh, the uh, particularly indicating the trochanteric flip kind of an osteotomy which we did. Uh, further images shows the CAM lesion which is identified on the neck and we excise the CAM lesion. Here we uh, visualize the labral tear. The labral tear was uh, visualized uh, uh, carefully and we kind of uh, reattached the labral tear and secured it with some suture anchors. So this is further in the uh, image. Uh, this was the post-operative radiograph which we got. Uh, here we uh, see that the trochanteric osteotomy has been fixed with uh, CC, uh, CC screws. And the labral tear was secured with uh, three suture anchors and we repaired it carefully. We did a complete excision of the as a impinging cam lesion and here which we can, which is evident on the post-operative x-ray. Post-operatively, uh, clinically, we followed up the patient at around two years and the patient was pain-free having a uh, uh, good range of motion. This is the internal rotation and further we did the external rotations, rotation movements. And the sagittal and the coronal range of motion was also fairly uh, painless and, and uh, good. So on follow-up, we performed this open cam excision and uh, labral repair with patients for around two years. The pain is pain-free right now uh, with a vast code which decreased uh, uh, to around 1 by 10. He has a good range of motion. Uh, thank you everyone for your patient hearing. Uh, the case was done under Kaliya sir. Yeah, so my question to the faculty is, uh, would you have done something else? What Argo missed was that we also excise the pincer. So I found that it was difficult for me to excise a pincer and reattach uh, labrum and also do a cam in a patient. So since we do a very small numbers of these cases, they come to us. So rather than doing a kind of a first uh, uh, hip surgery with a very complicated thing, I thought it would be better that we do it open and do a complete thorough job. Uh, 
Rajiv, would like to comment something or you would have done something differently? Right. You have to unmute uh, yourself. Yes. I got it, yes, sorry. So excellent case and a very good illustration of how to do a good open dislocation. Uh, two questions. One thing is the other side was very arthritic. Yeah. And is that not something that you felt you had to address? Yeah. If you're putting a patient on crutches for this side and know. you know rehab yeah. is difficult. Yeah. And uh, the but... second thing is the the condition of the cartilage I could not see yet. It was only had one slice of the MRI scan. Yeah. So uh, are you sure that the condition of cartilage was very it good was on pretty that decent. One? It was pretty decent on an MRI. We could not show all the images. And uh, what we thought was that if you don't do something, he's going to land up with a severe arthritis in this one as well. So what we plan is, uh, we plan to do a total hip uh, on the opposite side, but we were all affected by COVID and patients uh, obviously didn't turn up and we were not operating for a long period of time. So yeah, I know that the patient was on crutches and stuff like that, but his opposite hip is already gone. So I, I didn't uh, feel that uh, operating on that first was my priority. Trying to save this one was my priority. And uh, now we hopefully we'll plan to do a hip replacement on the opposite side. What are they? Any comments? So basically two things. One, uh, I have a slight difference of opinion. Uh, the axial cut, which Argya showed, essentially that has uh, osteoarthritic changes. So the, those are hip osteoarthritis. It's not a retroverted hip. It's basically the osteophytes, which give you an impression of the of retroversion. So it's actually an antiverted hip. The second thing is that the patient is already into hip aspherical congruency. And with the opposite side arthritic and this side already getting into stage four, um, really not sure uh, if uh, how much uh, a pre preservation procedure would have helped. Yes, impingement has gone off, which is excellent. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the subsequent inevitable total hip arthroplasty, which he's already getting into with an already affected left side, uh, We've actually, we are, we are walking into a scarred with situation uh, already. So I really don't know how much uh, we have helped the patient with the procedure. So we'd actually not just wait out and do the left side and then see how long that hip lasts rather than, you know, uh, already an aspheric congruency of the hip and go in and do a, a, a salvage. So what I'm not sure about is how much are we salvaging here, but it's a beautiful done job. It's taken away the pain completely. And that's a, 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 that's a remarkable achievement. So he's got something there, but I really don't know. In how terms of, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in absolutely. terms of- That is the problem with all, all kinds of hip salvage. Uh, you're trying to do something with probably a timeline kind of a thing, but you can never be sure how long. We have had all kinds of four decompressions done and uh, we had had uh, hips collapsing and becoming arthritis within a few years. So, so what, what is my to... what is my concern at this point in time is that uh, uh, we've we've routinely you know we have young hips and then we have younger hips. So you know uh, more and more uh, as the experience of the country is increasing with uh, total hip arthroplasty, we're increasingly doing and getting patients who are around 25, 30, 35, 40. And we've, we've had patients who've come for revisions and the quality of the revisions are, are really good. So uh, the question of, you know, uh, the earlier questions of uh, operating at 25 uh, is really not so much of a, no, of a brainer right now because we know that we can give them a very good first total hip arthroplasty. We can give them an equally good uh, uh, revision hip arthroplasty. So uh, getting in, him in scarred and into a situation where he, he might have, uh, we might risk uh, weakening his abductors and already getting into a scarred hip, probably I'm not so sure unless I'm very convinced of uh, what we can do. A hip arthroscopy in a stage two or a stage three, yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, a core decompression in a stage two or a less than a stage two, yes, definitely. Those are actually uh, real cost versus benefit. But somebody who's already getting into stage three and stage four, I would actually wait out a hip, especially if it's uh, congruent or aspherically congruent, and then just see how much it lasts. But Raju, you would like to say something about the case or like to comment? Yes. Or, yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, so probably like this case is the best, better example of like getting a standard age x rays. So if you have the, then the standard standing x rays, and also if you had measured the joint space. So in this case, I would have intervened if the joint space is more than 
like some some of my friends is 2.5 millimeter, but I my cutoff is three millimeter in standing X-ray. So in this case, uh, probably I may not have done this open procedure, but here maybe like you don't have arthroscopic uh, facilities there, you then like the open. I, I'm okay with it, but I don't know. Like he said, like you know, if you're doing even the CP arthroscopy, even though it's like two ports is a morbid procedure, we say at least we have to give five to seven years. Uh, so this one, it's already, you know what I mean, like he said, like three, three, four, probably like it's, it's actually, like he said, it's not a real free to order hip or anything. And you can see, already see in the MRI, there's a stable cyst. So probably I would have done either arthroscopy or just I waited and they did the uh, total hip. And that's, that, that's the route I would have done. But yes, like, but it's, the, the surgical technique and the, the way you guys did was awesome. And uh, but uh, uh, probably uh, I'm kind of like very rigid on uh, patient selection. Yeah, that's what I would uh, come on. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the end, uh, Dr. Ashok Shyam, you'd like to say something? You'd like to wrap this up? Hi. So I think the organizers and the faculty have put in a lot of effort into planning this particular event and uh, in in our one and a half years of doing webinars i think this is one of the most unique events that we have seen and very focused most most of the points that and the question that come in the minds of the viewers were already covered in the talk so hats off to all the faculty and the organizers thanks so much for doing this Thank you, everyone. Uh, from AIMS to Shikesh, uh, on behalf of the faculty, I'd like to thank all the people who have taken out two hours of their time on a Saturday morning or an evening and being with us. Uh, it's uh, been a very great uh, experience uh, interacting with all of you all over the world. And hopefully, we will try to make uh, a few more such uh, meetings possible in the future. Thank you, everyone. Any closing remarks from any of the faculty? You're most welcome now. Thank you, Dr. Kalia. Thanks for organizing. Great, great session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rup. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah good to see you, Sindhu. Dr. Raju, thank thanks. thanks. Thanks a lot. You would like to say something? Closing remarks? No, thank you, Dr. Kalia. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.